adjusting. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for taking time out of uh, your schedule on a bright and sunny evening. Uh, that tends to be my luck, schedule meetings when it's really bright and sunny outside. Um, so today we have a town hall with a couple of topics. Uh, we're gonna be discussing two ordinances, a B3 zone change ordinance and a shelter licensing ordinance. Um, before we do that though, um, and before we move on in our presentation, I'd like to just take a minute for each assembly member if they wanna introduce themselves and um, what part of town they represent. Um, and before we do that, just wanna note, I believe uh, Jamie Allard, who represents uh, Trigak Eagle River is running a little bit late. And then uh, Forrest Dunbar, who represents East Anchorage is I believe out of state uh, for National Guard duty. With that, I guess we'll start on this side with Mr. Constant and then we'll just go around the table. Hello everybody, my name is Christopher Constant and I serve the municipality in this district north of Chester Creek from the inlet to Mountain View. Good evening, um, Meg Zalatel, and I'm in District 4, which is Midtown. Um, Midtown is from uh, south of Chester Creek all the way down um, to part of Abbott Loop and in some parts over to Minnesota and Diamond and then kind of back up Arctic and Fireweed. So it uh, makes a couple of jogs. Thanks. Hi, John Weddleton representing District 6, which is Hillside. Uh, Ocean View, Bayshore, Southport, Turning an Arm, Girdwood, all the way to the southern tip at Ingo Creek. Hi, everyone. Felix Rivera, um, also representing Midtown with Meg. Good evening and welcome, everybody. I'm Suzanne LaFrance, and I represent District 6 with John Weddleton, the south uh, part of the municipality. Hello, I'm Crystal Kennedy, uh, representing District 2, which is for the most part Chugiak Eagle River, but it includes an area of Northeast Muldoon all the way to the Kinnick Arm Bridge. Thanks. Good evening, I'm Pete Peterson. I represent District 5 in East Anchorage, everything east of Bogaw, south of Tudor, all the way to the Glen Highway and the military reservation is the end of border on the east. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Jamie Allard. I represent Chigak Eagle River and our, my district is shared with Ms. Kennedy and we cover all the way from Aklutna to Northeast Muldoon to include Jay Bear. Thank you. Great, thanks everyone. All right, so agenda for today. Uh, so there's gonna be a brief presentation um, going over the two ordinances uh, for tonight. Then I'm gonna open it up to the sponsors of the shelter licensing ordinance to provide any additional comments that they may have. And then if the administration arrives today, I will open it up to them to provide any additional comments for the B3 zone change, which they are sponsoring. Um, then we're gonna open it up to public comments. Um, as folks can tell, there are two microphones, one in each aisle, um, just like, uh, any normal assembly meeting or other town hall um, will have three minutes for any initial comments you may have. And then from there, assembly members might respond and there might be a little bit of a, a back and forth uh, between the speaker and uh, assembly members. And then we will move on to anyone else who would like to speak. And then uh, we'll, I'll provide some time for closing comments from assembly members. Uh, and then that will be it for today. So we are scheduled from six to nine um, but we may end up uh, ending earlier. So just a few ground rules for today. Um, first is listening. So we are here to listen to you and your thoughts. And we're also here uh, to have a conversation. So like I said, you might hear some back and forth um, between uh, any public speaker and assembly members uh, when you come up to speak. Um, disruptions like clapping, et cetera, um, they shouldn't hinder listening um, because again, that's what we are here to do. Um, so uh, please, while folks are speaking, if we could avoid any disruptions, otherwise uh, disruptions should be as minimal as possible. And then interruptions, talking over each other, they shouldn't happen. They're only allowed by the chair, which is myself, if needed to move us along or maintain decorum. 
So expectations for the presentation. So this presentation is fairly simple. It's not meant to convince or champion a point of view. It's simply to provide the information that has presented that has been presented to the assembly and community. To that effect, the presentation materials. Um, so two of the presentation materials are on the table in at the front entrance, the text of AO 2021-54, which is the B3 zone change, as well as the text of AO 2021-55, which is the shelter licensing ordinance. There are three other presentations that I used to craft this uh, presentation for today. Um, the first being the um, planning a department presentation that they gave at community councils. Um, it's on the planning department's website, but I've also included a link here. And you can actually find this presentation uh, at the assembly's website. So if you go to muni.org slash assembly, you can find a link to this presentation. And from there, you should be able to get links to the other presentations as well. Um, there are also a couple other presentations um, that I used to craft this one. Uh, first is a sponsor presentation that was pr uh, done at the Assembly Committee on Housing and Homelessness. Um, it's found on the committee website. There's also a link here. And that was regarding the shelter licensing, as well as a transition out of mass care plan, which was supposed to be presented earlier today at the Assembly Committee on Housing and Homelessness. And so you can find all the links to that um, on this presentation. Okay, so what are we here today for? We're here for two ordinances, AO 2021-54, which is to allow the use type homeless and transient shelter in B3 district as a conditional use and to create use specific standards. This was sponsored by the planning department. The next we have AO 2021-55, establishing a municipal license requirement for homeless and transient shelters, sponsored by assembly members Zalatel, Constant and Weddleton. So I wanna go a little bit through the timeline of each of these. So for AO 2021-54, which is the B3 zone change, folks will remember a year ago, roughly um, AO 2020-58, uh, which was a B3 zone change introduced by the former administration during the summer of 2020, uh, sought to do this change without going through the planning and zoning commission process. Um, at the time we postponed that item indefinitely and the administration stated their intent fairly clearly to go through the planning and zoning commission process and bring it back to the body at some point. Um, the planning and zoning commission and planning staff uh, started doing presentations at community councils beginning in November and actually um, think they did their last presentation in May. So they've been doing presentations for several months now. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission process ended in March when they voted to uh, send um, the changes, the text amendment change to the assembly for consideration. And just like the other ordinance, uh, both of these are scheduled for a public hearing on June 8th. So timeline for the shelter licensing ordinance, as I understand it, um, so that's AO 2021-55. Uh, so the sponsors began putting together a proposal in 2020. Um, they met with providers to seek feedback, multiple iterations. And then there was a presentation done at the April 21st meeting of the Assembly Committee on Housing and Homelessness where we got to look at some of that feedback. And we um, sort of did, did a deep dive page by page, section by section of the ordinance. And then there was a presentation at the May 19th meeting of the Assembly Committee on Housing and Homelessness with some updates um, just based on the work that the sponsors had done. And then there is a June 8th public hearing on this item as well. Okay, so let's start with the B3 zone change. So the goal um, for this, according to the planning department, is amending Anchorage Municipal Code to allow homeless and transient shelters as a conditional use in the B3 zoning district and add use specific standards. Um, so first, what's the definition of a homeless and transient shelter? It's pretty clear in code AMC 21.05.040.c.5. Uh, it's a facility designed to provide minimum necessities of life, including overnight accommodation on a limited short-term basis for individuals and families. There's more to that definition if you'd like to see the code uh, specifically. Um, there's also another provision where it talks about uh, shelter, food, necessary medical and clothing needs and planning for more permanent, permanent housing and employment can also be at a homeless and transient shelter. The justification from planning, which was included in their presentation. Um, so homeless shelters currently are limited to one single zoning district, public lands and institutions, that's PLI zoned land, which makes it hard to provide additional beds. 
shelters are more compatible in business zoning districts than residential or industrial zoning districts. Business zoning districts are more likely to have access to support services and other communities across the country already allow these shelters in business districts. So that's the uh, justification planning provided to the various community councils and other presentations they did. Um, as I said earlier, aside from allowing homeless and transient shelters, this also does two additional things. It, it uh, implements a conditional use permit uh, for uh, shelters, and that's the process in a nutshell. There's much more detail to that, but um, the pre-application meeting, community meeting, um, application submittal, agency and department review, and then the public hearing before the vote at the commission meeting. Then um, the other part of the ordinance is setting a few use specific standards uh, to include 500 feet of separation distance between shelters. Um, that shelters need to be located within a quarter mile of a transit routes unless other transportation is provided and that secure storage for personal belongings must be uh, on premises. So moving on to the shelter licensing, um, the purpose, I'm just gonna read from the actual ordinance itself, um, the per part of the purpose statement. So the purpose of this chapter is to establish minimum standards of care and operation of homelessness shelters in the municipality, enable and maintain data collection and monitoring of the homeless population to maintain the appropriate level of control and authority in order to provide individuals and families experiencing homelessness with the care and services needed and mitigate impacts of neighboring residents, businesses, property owners, and the users of the shelters. Uh, going back a little bit, sort of bigger picture, uh, some of the need. So as of May 19th, there were roughly 685 single adults util utilizing shelter every night. I'm not sure what the current number is. Um, so as folks know, there are plans in place to demobilize our mass care facilities, including the Sullivan and others, uh, that would create a predicted need of about 410 to 500 single adult beds. As uh, folks may remember, the acting mayor did announce a plan um, using a variety of different um, private partnerships and federal resources uh, to house individuals or move them into other existing facilities. Uh, and I've highlighted specifically the 125 people in a new congregate shelter. I think that's a, a key point uh, for uh, part of the reason why this is coming forward. Um, this uh, ordinance does two basic things. It creates minimum standards for shelter operations, um, really looking at their policies and procedures and their operations and security plans. And it also ensures coordination of responsibility and communication. So implementing a good neighbor guidelines, which is um, the way that it's being framed right now is new, but isn't so new of a concept. It was actually used um, downtown and in some other communities where um, they had some issues with alcohol um, licenses as well as implemented with marijuana establishments as well. Um, an MOU between the provider and the community council and then municipal co commitment, right? What's the municipal skin in the game here? So uh, on the shelter licensing ordinance, um, I wanna go over the timeline really briefly and then some of the main sections of the ordinance. So the provisional licensing for new shelters uh, is gonna happen between the passage, assuming passage of the ordinance and January, 2023. Again, going back a couple of slides where I talked about that 125 uh, new shelter beds uh, need to be stood up. And then in January, 2023 is gonna be the effective date for established shelters and then uh, developing regulations or policy implementation, implementation guidance in the interim between passage and uh, January of 2023. So there's still gonna be quite a bit of work before it becomes effective for most of the shelters that are currently in place. Some of the main sections of the ordinance for folks who want to go through it, um, there are types of shelter, so it has some definitions there, pretty lengthy uh, sections on application for a license and renewal pretty lengthy section on operations and some of the expectations there, some uh, required reports to the assembly, and then enforcement, which I know uh, from my perspective, uh, there's a lot of interest in enforcement. Um, so at this point, I'll go ahead and open it up to uh, any uh, sponsors of the B, excuse me, of the shelter licensing ordinance, if you'd like to add any additional comments. Oh, 
Should I go ahead? Oh, thanks. So um, could people hear okay? Not yet? How's that better? Okay. Uh, thanks. So we have the shelter license um, proposal in front of us. And I, and I should say to anyone who's here, you know, these are introduced and they're in front of you. These aren't the end product as you who watch us on the assembly. We listen to people, we make amendments, we come out sometimes. If there's a lot of amendments, there's a substitute version we refer to as an S version. And so these are works in progress. So if you have read these and you have thoughts, share them and we're taking notes and our intent is to work on these and make them work better as, as they go through the process. So these are alive documents. These aren't like, this is the end, take it or leave it. We are here to ask how to improve these things. So um, I look forward to hearing your suggestions. Um, you know, on the shelters uh, licensing, we actually have, we're very fortunate. The city typically does not run shelters. We did not run shelters until COVID-19 backed us into a corner. And when the existing shelters cut back on their occupancy, we faced hundreds of people being left out on the street and we did set up the Sullivan Arena. Um, but we have, you know, the Rescue Mission and Covenant House, um, Hope, I see Sherry here, you know, there's shelters in town that do a wonderful job. They don't create a big problem in the neighborhood. Um, Brother Francis has been operating very well for the last year, but has had trouble over, you know, the last few years, you know, and it was for a number of reasons. And what we want to do is not make it harder for the shelter operators to do the important work they do for all of us but to make sure we don't have the problems that we've seen are possible. And that's, so we want a licensing system that's very gentle, but just prevents the worst problems. And, and right now I don't, the shelters are being run very well and we aren't seeing those problems. Uh, we just wanna make sure should more open up that we don't run into problems. That's kind of my broad view on the shelter licensing. And, and just while I got the mic for a minute, you know, on the B3, allowing shelters in B3, it's critical that conditional use. And what you see in front of you that came from the planning commission listed three standard conditional uses that they would um, you know, require for anybody coming forward for a shelter. But that list can be changed by us. We can add to that, take away. Um, but that's part of the process here. Are there other critical features? And looking, and that's more of a land use thing. You know, how, how tall would the fence be? How far would they be from certain different businesses and so on? Um, but those are things that we can also change there. So we look to hear from you, what would make it work better? I see John, the rescue mission here too. So glad to see providers here as well. Thanks. I'll just briefly add the chair described the origin of what is commonly called the neighborhood responsibility plan or an MOU. And he was right that it did evolve through the cannabis industry and before that in relating to alcohol licensees that were struggling in neighborhoods. But before that, even the first instance of it in the municipality was between the Fairview Community Council and the Brother Francis shelter. And it, it proved to be a sea change in the relationship between the organizations. And it began a conversation that we're having now a long time ago. Thank you. Just really briefly, I, I would like to um, underscore that um, from first draft to now, um, this document, this ordinance has been very responsive to both provider comments and community comments. So if you have um, feedback or other suggestions, please get them to us. Um, we're continuing to look at the ordinance, um, figure out how it would work um, logistically as we talk through it more, um, or if there are questions where the language leaves questions because you're unclear on how it would work, um, please ask them because the more conversation we have about this ordinance, because it's something new, um, the better product we'll have. Thank you. Great, thanks everyone. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on. Quick, quick question, Mr. Chair. Yes. For the YouTube stream, is it supposed to be video? Um, so uh, from what I understand, the YouTube stream is working right. Uh, I think it's the Facebook that isn't working. So- um, okay, thanks. Yeah, so for folks um, in the room, thanks for um, showing in person today. We also have a YouTube stream where folks are uh, watching us virtually. So thanks to, for everyone who is joining us virtually. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to 
the public uh, participation part of our evening. I'm just going to leave this um, slide of ground rules up um, for folks. Just as a reminder, there are two mics. Um, you will have three minutes. I will put a timer on um, and then I will generally ask you to uh, stop at the end of three minutes and then I'll, I will turn one way, turn the other way, see if there are any assembly members who have uh, comments and then we'll do a little bit of back and forth. Um, and then uh, we'll get through as many folks who want to speak uh, tonight as possible. Uh, and then if you are planning on coming on Thursday and you would like to add additional comments, you can also speak again on Thursday. And then nothing also precludes you from speaking at the public hearing because uh, tonight is not an official public hearing. It's, it's a town hall where we're hoping to glean some information from folks. So um, the public hearing for both of these items is scheduled for June 8th. All right, with that, let me go ahead and get my timer set up. So what, what I'll try to do is just one end and then the other and just go back and forth. Um, I'll go ahead and start on this end, so go ahead. It is not on. Hello? Yeah. Dustin Darden? As you, were, as you were giving the brief description of what your outline is for this, for this uh, controlling of Anchorage citizens by tracking, I'm, I'm thoroughly disgusted through the chair on the behavior that happened at Sullivan Arena. I witnessed this body implement intense radioactive devices to be installed on the top of the Sullivan Arena. I witnessed this administration indefinitely detain two individuals without any due process when they wanted to leave the Sullivan Arena, or was the Bim Boki? I want to put on the record that the control mechanisms that you are using to, to, to control United States citizens is outrageous. And I want to put on the record that through your actions, it's very evident that this body is working with a plan that is far greater than the 10 of you. And me, as United States citizen, would not be doing my duty to call out this tyrannical evil of control through your forced or implied forced vaccinations in these shelters, in these tracking through the 5G radiation. And all this needs to stop. I've heard of numerous individuals that were tested like guinea pigs that were homeless and you took advantage of them through the body, through your controllers. And I'm disgusted. And it all needs to stop. The shot causes blood clots. Thank you, Mr. Darden, your time is up. Thank you. You want some discourse, some back and forth, you said? I don't see anyone that has any questions. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, that one's not on. <laughs> Try it now. There we go. How about now? Excellent. Uh, so my name is Matt Duncan, and I am here to speak closer. Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, my name is Matt Duncan, uh, and I'm here to speak in support of uh, B3, Zone Change and Shelter Licensing, uh, members of the assembly and my neighbors that are here. I come from the old Hermit Park pocket neighborhood in Mighty Spinard, and uh, I, as many of other people here, have neighbors with severe problems and we need your help. Our neighbors are addicted to drugs, our neighbors have no jobs, no money, no prospects. Our neighbors have no housing. Our neighbors have mental illnesses and chronic medical conditions. My neighbors sleep in filth and defecate in the street and do not have access to running water or basic sanitation. I have neighbors who are disabled and will never recover. And those neighbors of ours must receive complex care solutions or they will continue to be the worst, and I mean, absolute worst neighbors that we can have. I've heard people say that we should incarcerate them. According to Google, that costs $49,800 per year, and it's a ridiculous solution for many reasons. Uh, there's no honor in kicking someone when they are down. Uh, incarceration provides little or no rehabilitation, and this is a cost burden what we do not have to bear. Currently, according to Google, we spend uh, $35,578 per year on our chronic houseless neighbors in crisis in forms of crisis intervention, jail, hospitalization, fire and police services. These two changes in our municipal code will allow us to put the services our houseless neighbors need on major transit lines and expand our opportunity for success for them. I support these measures because they are the best option for an untenable situation. And I support these measures because we should extend the opportunity for a life with dignity to our houseless neighbors. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Alto. Thank you. Could you tell me the figure again that you read off um, current spending on someone who's houseless? I missed it when you said it. It was just on Google, so I'm not vouching for it, but it was $35,578, and that was an average across states, so we're probably more. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, to the folks who just clapped, while I may agree with the sentiment, I would ask everyone to not clap so that we can get through the testimony, even though I believe that testimony was worthy. Thank you. Thank you. I heard I'm not seeing anything else. Thank you. I apologize. We have to leave, but everybody else do a good job. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for coming tonight. Welcome. I'm Michelle, and I'm a blue collar worker. <laughs> Um, I thought it was coming to a town hall tonight. That's how it was advertised in print. And maybe you don't understand what a town hall is, but a town hall is when the public is given an opportunity to actually ask you questions and get answers. This is a glorified testimonial in front of the assembly. So I'm very disappointed, first of all. Um, second of all, many of you already know that I'm a truck driver. And we all know what's happened to the Sullivan Arena. And I can tell you as my personal experiences, I hate getting sent into Midtown to do deliveries. I hate getting sent into downtown. I've had a man steal my stuff out of my truck. I chased him down because he picked the wrong woman to mess with and got my stuff back. But then after that, he saw me and with his other group of homeless vagrants, okay, homeless is one thing. Vagrants are another. Vagrants are the ones that we are all really tired of. They came up to the door of my truck, my work truck, and tried to get me to open the window. And I couldn't just drive away because I might run over one of them. So I had to ignore them until they walked away. I have twice had vagrants try to open the door to my work truck at A Street and Walmart. I have almost run over one when it has fallen out into the road because they're so wasted. I've seen a huge, dump area, like a, one of those red boxes, because of the amount of trash that the vagrants produce. So I have, I'm just going to back up a minute here and tell you, I have no skin in the game. Where I live, I live in a very secure area, probably like a lot of you. But what I've seen from driving around at all hours of the day is unacceptable. And when you say that incarcerating them is inappropriate, you are wrong. And the reason why is these people who are vagrants, not homeless, okay, because we all can be homeless at any moment. 
but the vagrants who are high as hell, falling off into the streets, getting hit by cars, causing nightmares for people who are getting hit by hitting them on accident because they've drunk and fallen into the road, need to have a moment of time where they are put somewhere where they have to detox and feel that pain. And if they feel that pain, maybe they will make a better choice. Now, I believe that there is a handful of you up here who have no idea. You just sit in your offices, you go to your meetings, you go to your luncheons, you don't get it. You just don't get it. There are a handful, there's like 200 and some vagrants, and that's the people who you have to deal with. And pushing them into the neighborhoods is only going to spread it. And it's going to make it worse for all of us. And just, I, I know you're going to do whatever you want because it's what you do. You're just going to listen to us. It's a waste of our time. But next time you guys have a glorified assembly meeting, make it clear. Because I worked my butt off today and I came down here thinking I'd be able to hear people ask you questions and get answers. But once again, here we are. We don't get any answers. We don't get to give you any questions. Silence people. Silence. They're in charge. Yeah, I'll clarify that. So um, thank you. And I, and I apologize if um, we weren't clear enough, but just like we have done with prior town halls, um, we are, uh, folks who come up to the mic are happy uh, to ask any questions that you have. And then um, if we have some responses to those questions, uh, we'll give them to you uh, tonight. Uh, otherwise we'll let you know we don't have a response, but we can look into it. So um, yeah, feel free if folks have questions that you can ask questions during your time. Sure, so uh, at the request of a couple of members that I'm hearing, um, M Michelle, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask? Okay, well, yeah, we're, Yep. So yeah, we're, we're, we're doing that. So you're, I think you were the only third person to speak. So we'll see if anyone else has questions. Um, okay, welcome. Hello? Are you there? Okay. Hi, I'm Ralph Naberga, and uh, I've been an Anchorage business owner for 40 years. Uh, I've been on the Anchorage Gospel Rescue Mission Board for 15 years, and um, you guys are real intimidating, really. It's like being in front of the Supreme Court. <laughs> in any case, <clears throat> I respect the responsibilities of your position, and I trust your intentions are secure, sincere, and honest with this chapter 16.125 licensing issue. Please know that my words are meant with sincerity and no disrespect whatsoever. <clears throat> I'm not sure that you quite understand the implications of this ordinance and what it will actually do. I wish all of you would come and take a tour of the shelter, look into the eyes of daily individuals as they register for the night of a meal, a bed, a soul well fed. Would any of you regarding 16.125.040A8, would any of you actually want to be known as the individual who voted to prohibit minors in volunteering in any way such as those associated with junior achievement or church youth programs or big brothers or boy scouts girl scouts or even a simple family seeking to help their neighbor all because they had not obtained a background check you 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 wouldn't want to be known for that i don't believe i, I simply just don't believe that that's what you want the Anchorage Gospel Rescue Mission has been serving the community for 50 years without a penny from the municipality of Anchorage, state of Alaska, and the U.S. federal government. We ask nothing of you. Only let us keep succeeding in supporting those in want and need 365 days a year. We are supported totally by the generosity of the individuals, businesses, and churches. And the community, just ask the community councils that we have in our area, what we have brought to our neighborhood parks and public spaces. Talk to the, your former colleagues, Dick Traney and L.B. Gray Jackson about their enlightenment 
after they attended one of our board meetings. We have over 8,000 Anchorage supporters who know what we do and how we do it. We don't have fights and crime in our parking lot. Check with the APD and see how often it is necessary for them to come to our facilities. In the current year of 2021, we've had them there a total of three times in six months. We daily register all guests with BRAC tests. I'm sorry to interrupt if you could just wrap up really quick and then I do have some questions for you. We need your endorsement and not a muzzle on our operations. In closing, I ask one simple question. I need to know in my heart why this is necessary. I really do. Because I think your intentions are great. Exactly. How often do you folks as a, at the municipality get a complaint Sorry for from, interrupting. From, um, from a homeless person? Yeah, thank you. So I do have a couple of questions, starting with Mr. Weddleton. Oh, thanks. Um, um, I do appreciate what you've done. I, I, I was got a tour, I think a year ago with my wife to see the rescue mission, it was amazing. And Th thank um, you. I've toured in other cities, parts of the same network that you're part of, and they've also been amazing. So it's very impressive. And, and our intent with this shelter license is absolutely not to restrain the amazing good work that you do. Um, our intent with this is to prevent problems that we have seen at other shelters. We wanna be very light and unnoticeable to the good things that you do, but we wanna make sure that the um, spin-off problems we've seen um, at other shelters don't happen to any neighborhood ever again. So you're not the problem. And, and I do remember from long before I was on the assembly, there were some issues and I, I know Dick Traney and Elvi and got real active on it. And I went to some meetings, I don't know much about it, right 15 years ago and uh, more. Um, and I think there were some changes made and, and it, those issues are gone. Um, so, but, uh, you know, our intent is not to impede your operations. And as far as the background checks, we've had a lot of discussions on those and we want to have those where they may be needed and, but definitely not to restrain volunteers coming who are- Well, sir, the kinds in, of this, in its doing. most current form as yeah, presented right. to me yeah. after, th I think three drafts, okay? This piece of legislation or ordinance will suppress, not help, the homeless people in this town. There will be nobody who will start and operate a shelter. Forget the conditional use. Just by the regulations alone, they're not gonna take in that headache. They're not gonna fight, fight, fight for the ability to serve the public. They just not. It, would, it sounds great. I mean, the buildings that you folks are buying, it sounds great, but who's gonna man them? Who's gonna enforce them? What kind of is the enforcement at these new buildings? I mean, if there's any money going anywhere, it should be going into recovery, which I didn't have time to co cover. Mm -hmm. But we have a 12 month recovery program and we have the greatest record in town about long-term recovery. And I, I, if you have seen, I know you've all seen Seattle is dying. In that movie, Seattle is dying, you will see a, a city and a state back on the East Coast that have a pretty close to excellent record on how to deal with the homeless. Like some of these other folks said, it's a choice. But you either, have, in those states, there's facilities for them to get the, what they need in treatment, which we don't have here. But in those states and in that city, if you break a law, which we already have laws on the books about peddling and all these other things, we have good laws. We just, we just, choose not to actually enforce them. In those states, if you break a law, you're treated like any other criminal, like going 75 miles an hour down C Street. You come to the judge and you have a choice. You either are incarcerated for X number of days, weeks, hours, months, whatever the law allows, or you take, like this one lady said, and you go into recovery. That's it. It's open and shut. Unfortunately, our plan appears to be, and I'm not sure, but it appears to be that our city plan is with these facilities that people will stay in them, drink their heart out, get up in the morning, and not go out into the community where we don't want them to be. We want them to get treated. I mean, we serve 42% of our people that spend nights there, our native culture. 
62% of the people that we feed meals to every single day, families that we can't house, are your natives. We're here to serve. We've been serving, Thank you. and we don't want to stop. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I do have a couple more questions for you, starting with Ms. Allard. Hi, Ralph. Thanks for being here tonight. Could you tell me fiscally how the licensing would affect you? Uh, we probably wouldn't have any of our current staff because our staff is made up of people that were addicted to something, came to our 12-month recovery program, graduated, learned a trade, applied to be a staff at our, off at our offices, our facilities, and we hired them and they serve and they would not meet the barrier crimes criteria that this piece of paperwork has. I looked up barrier crimes. It was like three pages of what constitutes a barrier crime. So nobody, we probably would not be able to keep any of our staff. Chair, I just wanted to be corrected. When I said the current licensing, I meant the one we're reading tonight. Thank you, Ralph. I appreciate your response. Thanks. And then uh, I am next. Um, so a couple of things. First is, could you repeat that code section that you cited? I just want to make sure I have the right one. Sure. It says, and I'll, I'll give you the, the layman's version. Yeah. And I'll give you the number too. It says anybody associated with the licensee, meaning our organization, that's of staff, a, an assistant, a worker there, a volunteer there. Mm -hmm. The word volunteer sits right there. Yep. And it says that they are going to be in any direct contact with the minor. They cannot have been, they have to have a background check. Well, nobody that's a volunteer is going to march their family in to get a background check. Not going to happen. Thanks. Do you have that code section though? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. 16-125-040. Great. Thank you. Eight, I just wanted to make sure we were talking about the same eight, section. Eight. Um, and then, uh, so I just want to reiterate what um, my colleague said, Mr. Weddleton, about uh, the committee meeting where we had, I think it was on, uh, it was the April Housing and Homelessness Committee meeting where we did do a deep dive into all of the different sections and we spent quite a lot of time on the uh, background check section. And there were several members, many of them who are here, who talked about that, that section likely being too restrictive. So uh, I would imagine that that is a section that we will be revisiting and amending, just like I think Mr. Weddleton said, what you see before you today is, is not going to be the final product. Um, there will be changes made to it. And I imagine that will be one of those sections. Well, I, I appreciate that. You'll also find language in here that says that you folks have the authority to change and make the, the requirements more great anytime you wish to, which I understand you want that ability, but you could have done that prior to now. You, you could have. Thank you. I have one more person in the queue, Mr. Constant. Yeah, thanks, not a question, but to that section, uh, we did remove and reserve section on youth shelters. The intent of that with a minor was for <laughs> shelters that operate for children and so it's that was a piece thank you for bringing it up and we would welcome you to send us any of your comments on specific portions of the licensing rules because we'll definitely take them into close consideration because that one is an example of a small part of the whole section we removed that didn't get removed and I, back to the point of barrier uh, crime issues we have gone back and forth and what we decided i believe in the final uh, discussion was that rather than us get into the weeds of how you choose your staff if you are an accredited operation which i understand that your operation is accredited that we would accept the accrediting body's determination based on your relationship with them and so i think we might have an opportunity to move past some of at least your biggest concerns but i would welcome you to send to us all of your concerns in writing because that's how we'll get this more perfect i know you folks are rational thinkers and if you think past the trauma that we have in our streets that we've heard about tonight and go into actual solutions, the actual solutions are not just a bed and a meal, uh, not just filling up the arena or the new buildings. The actions we need to take are recovery type of actions and enforcement, enforcement and recovery. There's plenty of food around. There's nobody that I know of that's gone to any of our shelters that hasn't been fed. 
And I'm not talking about just the Anchorage Gospel Rescue. I mean, I mean we have plenty of food here. And uh, so this is not an easy problem. It's difficult. Uh, it's real difficult. But we appreciate the community and your work that you're trying to do to fix this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I have one more person, uh, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for being here. And um, I've volunteered in the past myself at the Anchorage Rescue Mission, and I've brought youth groups in to volunteer as well. Um, and, um, you know, recognizing that there are a lot of things that you rely on volunteers for. So could you speak a little bit to that in terms of how much of the function of the, the, the mission there relies on volunteers? And then secondly, could you comment on how you monitor that, how you oversee those volunteers while they're there? Uh, number one, I don't have statistics to tell you what percentage of our operations are covered by volunteers. It's not a high percentage, but it's a very important percentage because those people feel good about themselves and they go out and spread the word about what we do and how we do it. And, and people decide to support us because their neighbor took their daughter over there on Thanksgiving and handed out turkey pieces. And so I, I don't have that answer for you. And what was the second part? Just if you could uh, explain a little bit about how those volunteer groups or individuals are monitored or supervised. Well, I, we don't have, to my knowledge, people coming there that we've ever had a problem with. And we don't have gangs show up to help volunteer at the rescue mission. Number one, they know we are a faith-based organization that believes in a higher power. We're like an AA on steroids, except we go beyond alcohol and addiction. Well, but we have a 12 month program. We go beyond that. We're not just a, a meal and a bed. We, we, we offer hope, but we don't just offer hope by saying, hey, you can change, go for it, buddy. We don't do that. And so I, I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Testing one, two, three. Uh, my name is Paul, middle initial D, Kendall, and I'm going to talk in this thing in, a, in the peripheral edges of it. But I do stand uh, in opposition to a lot of the things. You want to come fix this? Then I'll do this. I don't know what's going on with that mic, but if someone could fix that mic stand, it looks like the mic keeps coming loose. Could someone call a hockey player to fix it? I'm going to suggest we switch sides one more time. Sure, yeah, well, well that's getting fixed. Um, go ahead, welcome. Hello, uh, I'm Christian. I've uh, been uh, feeding my uh, unhoused neighbors for two months now, every Sunday. And uh, I've met plenty of them who are starving, so I don't agree with that. And I, I want to echo a couple points that uh, I don't think you guys have earned the power or right to, to the power to give me licenses. You yourself admit Anchorage has never run any homeless shelters. And now you think just because you ran a temporary one for some of the year, like you think you have a license to give licenses now? Like you have to at least like have like experience in doing this. And you just think you have like authority, you have the right to get the authority for it. A couple of specific points that bother me is in. 16125.005C2, uh, you just cite uh, the shelters must have a screening person submitted for uh, admitting under influence of alcohol or controlled substances. Uh, people who I've been drunk and I've been high, I have needed to sleep during all of those times anyways. Like I've just, people need to sleep, even those who are drunk and high. And I don't think if shelters can deal with those situations, it's none of your business. Uh, Going on to the licensing thing, uh, requirements, I have issues with those as well. Uh, number 10, a sworn statement that no applicant owes pass due taxes, fees, or fines to municipality. I'd like to remind you that those taxes, fees, and fines are supposed to like, supply to us. They're supposed to give us like the resources and supplies. Like the taxes should be going back to the community. And it seems backwards for to use that as a barrier for people to supply the community themselves. Uh, going on to number 11, 
uh, must, uh, the good neighbor policy. He cited that the standard for the precedent for that was being alcohol and marijuana uh, stores, which I'd like to remind you, beds are not either alcohol or marijuana. That seems a ridiculous uh, precedent to set there. Uh, also the requirement of uh, mostly as far as the littering and loitering. Uh, littering is in fact an infrastructural problem. Disney has known that for decades. And it's actually your guys' problem that we don't have any trash cans in Anchorage. And so if you want to fix that problem, rather than policing our uh, shelters, you should put trash cans up. Uh, loitering as well, but like, it should not be illegal to be anywhere. Like that's not a real crime to stay in public space. And that one's ridiculous, of course. So can you like define why you think this is justified? Like what specific reasons made you write, write these laws? Great, thank you. So I'll go ahead and look and see if uh, anyone, okay, go ahead. Um, so thank you for um, bringing um, very specific concerns. Um, so in terms of licensing shelter, um, lots of facilities that provide care to people are licensed. Um, in fact, um, daycares are licensed, um, treatment facilities. Daycares are in fact not shelter things. So again, why? What, uh, so, I can either Actually, answer Ms. your question or Ms. Zolotel, if you don't mind. So I'm just going to go back to some of our ground rules and interruptions. If we can not interrupt, that would be really helpful. If you have some, some additional feedback after Ms. Zolotel responds to your question, we'd be happy to hear that. Go ahead. Um, so other types of facilities that provide care are licensed. Um, it's both to ensure good quality care for those who are receiving the care there, and also as Mr. Welton and Mr. Costin have pointed out, um, to protect and be proactive against any neighborhood impacts. Um, on your specific concern about drugs and alcohol or controlled substances and alcohol, the ordinance requires that the facility have its own policy and procedure in place about how it will handle individuals who present who may be on drugs or alcohol to ensure that they have adequate resources to do so. It's not simply that you can't admit them. Um, it's just to ensure that if the facility is going to admit an individual who um, is on a substance or um, has consumed alcohol, that they have adequate resources so that they can handle the situation. And a lot of the way this ordinance is written is show us what your policies and procedures are or your accreditation standards are and what your plan is and if it's sufficient that's great it probably is because as Mr. Weddleton has indicated most of the facilities in town have operated without problem um, but we don't have a uh, lens into what those policies procedures and operations plans are and this is one way to do that. I like to remind that the fear of things happening is not justifiable reason for you guys to claim more power for yourselves. And also I'd like to remind you once again that we've been doing just fine up until now. So I don't see why you need you to have this power and why you should have it. Thank you. Don't see anyone else. Thank you. All right, hopefully everything's working now. Well, first I'd like to convey my, my sincere and heartfelt thanks to Mr. Lewis Embryani, and if I understand him correctly, he's with the Alaskans for constitutional rights. And I'm not here to promote him. This nice to see that he can hold up the technical end here at this particular moment. Uh, my name is Paul, middle initial D Kendall. I've been around a while. Uh, I'm just a simple man, uh, has an overwhelming curiosity, the wonders of it all. And this is my name and this is my number. And if you have a problem or something else, please feel free to contact me. I'm gonna talk about the issue in a peripheral direction. Uh, earlier today, I submitted five pages of, of um, suggestions to the mayor, uh, the new mayor. We can no longer continue to do business as usual. The last thing we need is a mayor to return us to the normal position. It's that business as usual which got us into this damn divisive issue we're in today. It's time we're done. It's time to evolve, move forward quickly. These are my priorities that I think we need to, to attend to immediately with an overwhelming engagement. If most of the things we're seeing are symptomatic. We just do symptom after symptom after symptom. It's becoming a looping deja vu moment. It's embarrassing and it's tasking. I'm fed up with it personally. Now, having said that, Come back to these two things here. I am not narcissistic. What I'm concerned about is this, that our, our continued 
our con continued confrontation of cultures, which looks like it's going to be leading to a conflict if we're not very, very careful. In this moment, we're going to need more and more moments to gather as a people. And in those moments, I see people give testimony that is just wondrous. It's articulate, it's concise, it's imploring, it's exemplary, it's emotionally restrained, it is magnificent. When I go to contact that person, I don't have a damned idea who they are because you people, who are the leaders now, you can no longer obfuscate or continue to hide behind fiduciary mal malfeasance, okay? You people are not doing what you should be doing. Suggesting to you is that at the public door when you come in, this is 11 by 17, this is my name and my number, there's no reason why you can't print out a little sign for those people that want one. Then we can recognize those people. And the reason we need to recognize those people is our people in our community that are exemplary. I am staggered by the clarity of their commentary, by, by, the, by the understanding and the connectivity of it. And we need to understand those people to bring them together in town hall meetings. Because if we don't do it, we're damn well going to suffer the consequences of that. So please have, it costs 58 cents at Kinko's, have your name and number made up here so that we can take this with us in the video and make contact. Now, that's why that's there. Now, setting that aside, setting that aside I'm a, I, I am opposed to this current rate or rule or whatever you're doing here. In my opinion, and this opinion stands to be redirected, I may be wrong about that. This is what used to happen in the old days. You should apologize because you were incorrect by the time you listened to all the testimony. That's the way this country was built. It's my belief you need 500 to 1,000 acres, 5 to 10 miles out of town. I'm, I'm we sorry need to, to interrupt, but if you could wrap up in a few sentences, two or three sentences, that would be great. Your time is up. Well, it's difficult for a man, my inclination to do that, Mr. Rivera, but... Uh, if you'll, if you'll guarantee us that we can have point counterpoint, that we can respectfully get back up and engage and challenge and chastise and interrogate and probe, I have no problem with that. With three hours, I can think this could be a magnificent diamond of a moment. And I, and I guess I'll, I'll wrap up out of courtesy to everybody else that's here, but I do have things I wanted to kind of surmise and bring into my position that were rel more relative to this issue. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Zalatel. Um, sir, Mr. Kendall, correct? Um, yes. Could you, in like one or two sentences, tell me you said I am opposed because or whatever, could you give us the initial piece of that? Sure. I, I am opposed because I don't see how in the world if you use common sense deductive reasoning, you cannot commingle and interlace these people. Many of these people have different degrees of challenges or injury. We're not sure what their journey is. You cannot commingle these and delineate and define. This is something that we've created in our society is gonna be around for a long time. I can't believe I'm suggesting that we need to start a community five to 10 miles outside of town. But when you see, this, when you see the complexity of this and the denial of, of individual rights due to your failures, leaders, I don't see any other recourse. If we park them outside of town, we can delineate and define every nonprofit that's out there instead of being a political contribution. We can begin to see where is it? Is it schizophrenic? Is it the male female role in the home? Is it the educational indoctrination? Is it, is it the communistic or capitalistic society? We cannot, we cannot delineate and define and resolve as long as you bunch them up in some coagulated mass. I hope that gives you an answer. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kendall. Um, you mentioned that you had several points there, and did you say that you have actually emailed that to assembly members? I just wanted to be clear that we already have that, or do I need you to read those points that you had on your sign? Well, I'd like to seize the opportunity and abuse your request to a question, I'll give you those answers. I've constructed these trying to weigh whether they have validity to them or not. The four points we need to address immediately, setting aside all of our differences and keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, I'm an old guy. I've never seen days like this in my lifetime. This is unbelievable. We need to immediately begin to redesign our voting process. Never ever again should I mistrust my neighbor in the transport, transmission, or simulation, or, or, or a, a, a broadcasting of voting results. That should never, ever, ever happen again. The next thing is the election process, the way we elect you people and others, it's failing us like we've never seen before. It has to end. The way we elect you, the way you present yourselves to us, the way we interrogate you, the way we define you has to be redesigned. The third point, is the fake capital in, in, in Juneau. 
well, I was going to come back to try to explain to you when I mentioned 500 to 1,000 acres outside of town, we are subsidizing these people in Juneau, these 60 to 100 people and, and, the, and the bodies behind them. They bring us nothing, nothing Mr. but Kendall, wreaking havoc and injury at one more than get. Mr. Kendall, it, um, I know I have known you to be very active and um, over the years always had a lot of opinions and thoughts about a lot of things in this state, but I just wondered if you could focus on the homelessness issue, if any of your points had anything to do with the homelessness issue and licensing that we're trying to work through right now. Well, if I might conclude the fourth, then I'll, I'll answer that if I might. And I'll, uh, the fourth is we need an open talk public platform. You people are failing us in, in the city council meetings. Those are, those are, those are done. You go down there; they're abusive, they're, they're bullying, they're, they're, they're self defeat. They take away your self esteem, your dignity, or you want to participate. We have to have a public, a public platform into which we can engage with whiteboards, and it, 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 we have to be able to do interrogating and, and probing and heated moments. Some of these issues are so complex and interwoven and, and overlaced and impressed that we've never seen in our lifetime before. Now, the point is this: what I'm trying to show you is. When, I, when you go down to drill down to specificity, you have to find the cause. Everything has a genesis, a source, a causation. We cannot get to that causation, that source, with these overwhelming, distracting, deflecting issues. These things are, are, are they're, they're enormous in size. They're foundational in their, in their structure. Everything you do else is for naught. And the things that are coming our way, the, the, the magnitude of these events that are coming in size and scale are enormous. They're unprecedented. You're going to have to reconstruct, and with this new mayor, I'm, I'm, I'm really taking advantage of your moment, I apologize. With this new mayor coming on board, and you folks representing such a, such a, I tell them, look, this is a battle between the morally inclined and the morally deviant. We're way past Democrat or Republicans, but it's bigger than that. But with these moments coming, here's a chance for all of you to shine, to damn well find where we're going to go. Because you, right sir. now, our children are being affected. Everyone's beginning to use a child as one means or another. Thank you, sir. And, Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be so, I think I abused your, your question. Thank you. All right. I don't see anyone else. Welcome. Good evening. I don't know if you can hear me, but. Oh, sir. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Good evening. My name is Caitlin Shortell. I was born and raised in Alaska and I'm a, a small business owner in downtown. I live in Spinard and I just want to thank the assembly for having this town hall and allowing us to discuss this important measure. I do support um, the measure that you're, we're talking about tonight and um, for a few reasons that I just want to discuss. The first reason is it's clear to me having lived here my whole life. And also I worked as a child protection attorney at the attorney general's office that we have needed for a long time an expansion of housing for people who are experiencing um, houselessness as well as issues with substance use disorder and mental illness. And, um, and it's important that we we keep our children safe in this community. And I really respect the assembly's efforts to come up with a measure that will uh, expand the available housing in the municipality that will um, do, do this in a reasonable, with reasonable care in a safe way. So I'm, um, I'm, I support the use of some barrier crimes. It's consistent with other licensing in the city and state to make sure that recipients of services and people in the community are, are safe. And also the uh, provision for being able to modify um, the specifics as you, because I think you're really saying to the community that you're willing to engage in a collaborative process and you know from experience that that's going to be necessary in dealing with the very complex problem of houselessness and all of the other social issues that I just listed. Um, I love my community and um, it, and I deal with people, I serve people every day who have experienced homelessness, who experience substance use disorders, who deal with mental illness, um, and who are running businesses in, in a municipality that um, has been plagued by these issues. And I applaud you for 
trying to create a flexible process to make sure that we can expand housing, um, make it safe, and also keep that process modifiable. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Thank you, Ms. Shortell. In tonight's testimony so far, and I'm sure we'll hear more of this to come over the next week or so, one individual referred to people as it and suggested that if we do this, we're only going to spread it. As a civil rights attorney, what are your thoughts on kind of the history of Anchorage in the provision of services to homeless individuals and keeping them in one corner of this town? Well, um, I, I believe that you know a lot more about that history than I do. I have read the history of um, limiting, you know, where certain people can live. I'm aware of restrictive covenants that were throughout the city that wouldn't allow um, people of different races and faiths to live in many of our neighborhoods. And I'm aware of the history where certain areas um, became a concentration for, for people who are poor or experience houselessness. And I understand and support um, this measure that would expand the areas uh, where people can be housed and receive treatment um, and with, with protections so we can make sure that it doesn't um, impact, negatively impact the community. But in terms of, you know, I, I know there's been litigation in the city over um, the city's actions with regard to the homeless. And so it's gonna be important that the assembly consider those cases so they can make sure that everything that they do now and in the future complies with the constitution. And so that could, you know, we could go on and on about all of that, but I know ACLU was involved in that litigation and that you're all aware of it. And that's why you're being so careful now. So um, I would of course never refer to human beings as it, because I think that's how we, I mean, all of us bemoan divisiveness and um, in order for us to, Come, overcome the polarized situation we're in, we have to love each other and respect each other. Even those of us who, you know, we have brothers and sisters and kids who are, have substance use disorders, um, are of different races and so on. We have to love each other and come together cooperatively um, just with the idea that we all have basic the basic right to dignity and respect, and we can't just warehouse people, incarcerate them, um, and so on. And and so that's my view. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Gary Clark. I live uh, in the neighborhood that the uh, proposed uh, Midtown Alaska Club homeless shelter will be. I've lived there for a long time. I live on the streets of Anchorage, so I pretty much live around, like not live, but you know, go around um, on bikes and walking most of the time. So I get a pretty close up view as I'm sure most of us do. Um, it's bit it feels like to me an issue that's been pretty much ignored for a long time uh, with the population rising of the people who need our help. Um, or anyone's help really. I see, I meet uh, these people that um, everyone's talking about who, you know, are, are just, they stink. They swing at you, they get drunk, they get violent, and they have a disease, most of them, uh, called alcoholism. Some of them don't drink at all. They just live on the street and steal and things of that nature. We all know this. And I feel like that I approve this. Uh, it, um, building being for housing, but I feel like it's too little too late. I also feel like uh, I'm ashamed of some of my neighbors who wanna, uh, you know, right away just say no, instead of exploring options. I live off of uh, Eagle and Togiak Circle, and right there at the end of Denali, there's an opening, a punch out, that you used to have vehicles that would go through um, I think my mother spent about 10 years calling the, or four years calling the city to block it off because people would speed through there. 
Well, right now it's open. And I feel like that when you open this place that people who don't want to go there or collect around there or come around this way will want to go through Eagle Street to get to say the weed shop um, or just to International over there to, to get to that side. Um, so maybe some uh, fencing could go up, signs maybe, security cameras in use, neighborhood watch if uh, we can get a neighborhood watch started in that particular area of Heather Meadows. Um, and then I don't, I apologize, I'm not aware of the particulars of the facility itself. I will say personally, I feel disappointed that it's only a Dave facility. I don't know what kind of security there will be. I don't know what kind of uh, exactly what resources will be available. But uh, overall, I think my opinion is that it's too little too late. I also feel disappointed that the Route 60 that used to go from down Old Seward is gone. And I feel like that if that were restored, um, a bus route on that street, it would kind of mitigate some of the traffic going through there. I apologize, I have a hard time breathing. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, and that, that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any discussion. I, did, I just have one thing since, since you mentioned the bus route. This was maybe a couple years ago, I think for the 2020 budget which we passed in November of 2019, Mr. Peterson and I did uh, have an amendment that would bring back the old 60 route. It's just taken a little while because of COVID for them to actually reinstate, reinstate that route, but it should be coming soon. Sure, I actually have a question. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Allard. So um, can I have your first name again, please? My name is Gary, G-A-R-Y, Clark. Thank you. Gary, are you, you're currently homeless right now. I, I live on the streets of Anchorage, but no, I'm not homeless. I, I spend my time on the streets of Anchorage. Okay, okay, that, that totally changes my question then. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Kathy Lamantia. I'm the other Lamantia. I'm John, the director of the Anchorage Gospel Rescue Mission's wife, and I have been the community engagement person for basically the time that John has been the director and that involves volunteerism. And I do that myself on a volunteer basis. And when I applied to do that, I had to fill out forms, who I was, you know, information about myself. I had to provide three references, which I actually think in my case, almost 50 years of being married kind of gave me a waiver on that regard. But people who want to come to the rescue mission, they have to go through a process. They fill out information, they provide references. Most of them come through a church group of some kind. And their references are also checked through their individual pastors or the group that they are affiliated with. They're given a, a code of conduct that's reviewed with them and they have to sign off because there are actually people who would use the rescue mission like a dating site, believe it or not. And there are people that want to take advantage of homeless people. There are also people that don't seem to have a natural defense against some individuals who would take advantage of their kindness. And so the mission tries to have a code of conduct that just makes that balanced on both sides. Uh, if people are seen stepping outside of that, there's a counseling session that can take place. And if that doesn't seem to work, then people are uninvited to volunteer. In terms of areas to volunteer in the mission, unlike some other shelters that rely on a lot of their core positions, uh, you know, need volunteers for that, the mission really does not. Mission is kind of unique in having a recovery program that has a public service and a service requirement to the program. So many of the people that are in recovery are helping in certain clerical areas and kitchen areas of the mission. The mission does have volunteers predominantly in the chapel. And those are people that are coming from set churches that support us that come uh, under the auspices of their church. 
and they are conducting a service, usually a Bible study in the evening from 7.30 to 8.30. That's the biggest area where we have volunteers. We have volunteers for special events, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, folks that are helping pass out gifts, clothing, uh, meals, that type of thing. We also have volunteers that provide transportation. We have a number of native people in our program and John very much wanted them to connect with opportunities within their own culture. Uh, at South Central, for instance, they have drum workshops. And so we have people that ferry some of those people that are enrolled in those back and forth between South Central and the mission. We also have an art program and we have local artists who volunteer it's, to sorry that for art interrupting, program. But your time is up if you just want to finish up nope, your thought. That would basically okay. be it. But that's, it's a large percentage in some areas. It's a very small percentage in others and it's very well supervised. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Mr. Whittleton? You know, like most things, it creates more questions, but that was actually very helpful. And I mean, it, you kind of assume you have a, in my Pardon little, me? I guess we assume that you would have some method for volunteers. It was nice having hearing you kind of spell that out. I have a little bit different uh, questions because I, I know you have a program. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. My belief is you have a program. Some people are in that program. They're there full time. Um, that's kind of your elevated level of help. And then, but you do also provide just so they can sleep there at night. Uh, maybe get breakfast and then they leave, come back in the evening. And um, so what, now when they leave it, are, are they just like, okay, time for you to go and you go? Do you um, provide them transportation if they want it to some event during the day? If they're not in your program, I, I'm kind of looking at just the people who are just kind of there overnight. Okay. But what's your, I mean, what happens to those people? They just go out in the woods? I or? can answer that for you. Um, you know, many shelters have, people that are just there in the evening and there's a turnout time. Number of them, it was seven in the morning and pretty much any conditions. And John woke up one morning and it was cold. And he said, we can't do this. We have to do better than this. I can't see people. I don't want my people, he calls them his dear ones, out in the cold and the dark in this, we have to come up with something. So we talked to the board, talked to the staff and said, we need to have a voluntary day shelter. Doesn't matter that we never did it, we need to do it now. And so when weather is inclement, you know, raining cats and dogs, when it's cold, when it's snowy, people stay all day. They can watch movies, they can attend our computer classes, they get integrated in with some of the program classes. They are able to recharge their cell phones, apply for jobs, various things. Some people who are not in the program live there for a certain period of time and they sleep in the evening, but they get up and they go to their job in the daytime. The mission also changed the turnout time in the day to after nine o'clock, not seven in the morning, breakfast and then out. If conditions are bad, people stay. Occasionally, we've had someone who just had such emotional problems that they could cope fine if they were around people. They just didn't do well if they were out on the street. Special arrangements for special people. But that's basically what, what we do. Good. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Kara, and I live in Midtown. Um, I wrote something. Your ordinance does not address the most important aspect. Needed. Sorry, ma'am, can you move a little bit closer to the microphone, please? Pardon me? Can you move a little bit closer to the microphone, please? Okay. Thank you. Your ordinance does not address the most important aspect needed. Many of the homeless will require habilitation from the alcoholic and drug addictions before or while they're in before they, any housing would be considered or while they're in rehabilitation, they'll need housing. The basic, uh, the basic problem without rehab, they will return to the streets with their alcohol drug habits. They're not going to stay in housing. During the winter, yes, they will return to housing, but when the weather becomes warm, they'll return to the streets in open lots. But the main reason they are homeless, they do not care to obey any rules or leasing regulations or rules just to leave 
and wonder and live without help doesn't bring the change in their lives. I, as a bus rider, will, will not be safe, don't feel safe walking to the bus stops anymore, uh, probably more in later in the evening. All you're pro proposing with these other housing units will be like Carlick housing, allowing them to live till they die with no rules, no changes. They need to be removed from areas where alcohol and drugs are, are so prevalent and easy to obtain. Unless they are re rehabilitated, it's money going down the toilet. You're wasting money without a guarantee of no, of any good returns and no guarantee. And placing them in the neighborhood also endangers people living there. Trash needles and paraphernalia will continue to pollute the neighborhoods like Benson, Benson and Denali and, and Northern Lights and A Street. Everywhere in the Midtown, you'll probably, uh, you probably will uh, will need to uh, invest in a porta potty system because they are not allowed in the businesses because they're not paying customers, and this is this is the problem. There is no way for where those people can go to take care of their personal problems in that respect. But without rehabilitation and and, and encouraging them to change. Their, their alcoholic drug habits and um, they, they, the reason why they're not in housing now or public housing now is because they don't want to ag agree with the leasing rules and the housing prop, uh, rules. And um, because most apartment complexes, they do have rules and regulations that you follow and they don't want, like it. So they don't have housing for that reason. Thank you. I do have a question for you, ma'am. Mr. Weddleton? Maybe not a question, but you, you prompted a comment. Um, I, I think when we, these things, these ordinances that are proposed here are absolutely should not be considered the cure for anything. Okay. They're, they're certainly not. This is a room, it's echoing, and I can barely hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, it, no one should look at these two ordinances and think that they are presented as the solution for anything. They're not the solution. I think, as you say, you know, if you have people, a big segment of the people we're talking about are drug and alcohol addicted, and that needs to be helped. And we are working on that as well. So there's the whole spectrum is being worked on, but this is also an important piece. And one component in, you know, what we know best practice is shelters is it's not just a mat on the floor, but there are services around to help people get out of that lifestyle. Um, the purchase of the golden line is for rehabilitation that we know we desperately need. So, so this, the, these ordinances are just part of kind of the whole spectrum of things that well, we need to do as a community, it's plus more toilets. Like from the very beginning that people- Sorry, could you, could you speak into the mic again, please? Transit places. Ma'am, could, you, could like you speak into the mic houses. again? Huh? Could you speak into the microphone? Okay. Thanks. Uh, Every time I read anything about the housing uh, transit quarters, it sounds like you guys are trying to re create another Carlock housing project. And you go down there, they don't do anything with the guys. They just let them stay there. And, and of course, across the street and near the street, there's alcoholic places, you know, uh, bars and, and stuff across the street and everything. And there's no rules to say that or rehabilitation to take care of them. They go in there and, and I've heard from friends who work there that they just stay there and die. There's, they don't do anything. They don't g give them much except in-house housing. And this is why they need, people need rehabilitation so they can change their lives so they can get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, Roger Branson. I'm a longtime advocate for mental health consumers and a resident of Anchorage, currently in Eagle River. Um, I want to um, speak of the necessity for the two shelters we have, that is the Gospel Rescue Mission and the Downtown Hope, and, that, and point out that those people serve a percent of our population. I represent all the folks, but a percent, about 15% of them, um, that receive services there, they that that's the spot for them. That's where they that's where they get what they need, 
and it's a very important um, service that they provide. So I, I pray that through this process that we do no harm to them. And, and I, I think everyone's committed to that, um, myself for, for certain. However, there's a lot more than just the people that they can serve um, out there homeless right now and in need of services. Um, I would be one of the 85% of the people who would not be able to receive services there. And, and that's because it goes back to my history. I was born here in Anchorage uh, 60 years ago, a little over 60 years ago, just a few blocks from where I stand right now. Um, growing up, there were um, um, some robust services to homeless folks in the community. Um, but I, I'm also a member of the faith community, I'm, 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 and I've attended uh, many of the churches that, that, that are represented here in Anchorage. And one of the recurring jokes that I heard from the pulpit that I've heard repeated over and over and just, just in recent uh, months um, has to do with one of the original founders um, in a moment of levity from, from the pulpit, not, not to the people, but would, would um, had this, um, this committee um, uh, thing that he would share that, 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 that spoke to the futility of how they perceive delivering services to the homeless folks. And, and he would say, if only we could pray them to repentance here, <laughs> baptize them and put them right in the electric chair we could solve our problem. And, and of course it was in jest, it was in levity, but to me it spoke to that they really didn't believe at times what they were, were, were the mission that they were about. And, and it caused concern to where, you know, I would not be able to receive services at these because um, I would be vulnerable. And so um, I think these are very worthy missions and for the people who find services there, we need to protect them. Um, but we need some licensing, some regulations to be able to expand services, especially services where the individuals getting treatment are able to give feedback about what does and doesn't work and that their voices get heard um, when, when, when appropriate. So thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh, I have a question for you, uh, Ms. Zalatel. Hi, Roger. Thanks for coming. Um, so on the point of giving feedback right now, we haven't included anything specific in the licensing ordinance to require like a client grievance procedure. Um, in your experience or knowledge, do you know if the current operating shelters in town have a client or resident grievance procedure that you've seen that you like? Or um, if you know of one, um, I would just ask if you could share it. Um, it could be something that we could leave to each facility, but um, I've been thinking about this a lot too, um, and I'm glad you keep bringing it up, but I haven't landed on anything. So I, so I know Beans at the Mass Shelter did have uh, suggestion boxes, and, and I do know that they had a process for evaluating them. I do not know what that process was, but you know, things just as simple as that is a start to getting feedback from how the people are perceiving lives in the moment. So many of our folks are caught up in survival mode and they can't perceive beyond a day, two days, three days in the future for a variety of reasons, um, very valid. And, and so, you know, catching those opinions in the moment while they're happening um, would provide much insight for you folks. And I very much appreciate seeing um, pretty much all of you at the shelter at different times um, um, wanting to know what's going on. So thank you. Thanks, I have one more from Mr. Constant. Thanks, I just wanna maybe broaden a little bit of what you were suggesting, Ms. Zalatel, that it wouldn't simply be a grievance process, but rather more of a council process where clients, people who use the services are heard from, not just when things are wrong, but when things are working. And I think if you were to hear from a number of the shelters, they have these processes in place. And I think that it would be wise to build on that rather than uh, kind of frame it up if we're gonna put it into the code as some kind of a grievance issue instead more counsel. Yeah, I totally agree. And and, and I think you're spot on. Um, uh, um, um, some kind of process where they can reach around their immediate provider and have their voice heard as well. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you. My name is Chris Cavett. I'm a clinical psychologist um, here in Anchorage. I'm a lifelong Alaskan. My grandfather was born downtown Anchorage, so my family has roots here. So it's super important for me to be a part of this discussion. 
Um, I was fortunate enough to do um, research in Anchorage with the homeless population to understand what the construct of recovery means for people who had co-occurring homelessness and substance misuse and found recovery in their life. And there are some important, uh, I think, lessons from that that we can apply to how we're seeing this uh, community network of shelters for our most vulnerable and marginalized uh, individuals in our town. Um, I've, been, I've had the fortunate opportunity to serve on the board of the Anchorage Gospel Rescue Mission since 2017. And there are some aspects of the ordinance that I'm a little concerned about on how it could impact our daily, daily operations and the important service that we provide to the community. Um, I, after listening to Kat <laughs> describe in such detail and eloquence on how, how our program runs and can be so fluid to serve the needs of our community, my, I, I'm not even gonna go down that road because you heard it already. The concern I have is this type of ordinance will be so cumbersome and inhibit our ability to provide like in the moment services to this uh, population in desperate need. So um, one of the things that I'm kind of hung up on, uh, and one of the younger gentlemen earlier brought up as well, was the, uh, the reference to the screening uh, persons admitted under the influence of alcohol or controlled substances. Uh, one of the important things that the rescue mission does in Anchorage is we are one of the, I think the only sh daily shelter for people who self-select to be in a sober environment. There aren't any other places for people who are homeless that want to be in a sober environment for, for them to go. So when you talk to people who are homeless and they, and they talk about what their options are, the rescue mission is where they go to, be, to feel safe. Many people will tell me that they won't go to some of the shelters unless they're intoxicated because it feels so stressful to be um, given opportunities to use or to be around people who are using. Also people that have been the victims of domestic violence or sexual assault from perpetrators that are under under the influence of drugs or alcohol can have that tra traumatic history be omnipresent in a setting like that. Obviously, we need to have a shelter setting where people who are intoxicated can go to be safe from the environment. At the same time, we need to really make sure that we have um, environments like the rescue mission where people can self-select to be in a sober environment where they're not feeling threatened or at risk from other people who are still in the midst of their substance use. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a couple folks in the queue for you, starting with Mr. Constant. Thank you, sir. I um, share your I share your belief and, and vision that there should be spaces in this town for people who are sober and that we need to create more of them. And at the same time, of course, we have uh, needs for people who aren't there and may never get there because of whatever circumstances of their life. It's challenging. I work in a recovery environment. And so it's a core value of mine. It seems to me that the item that you pointed out to, though, if the, the rescue mission has a sober policy, then they clearly have a method or, or a policy to determine if someone is intoxicated or not, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so people who come to the rescue mission, whether it's me who's on the board of the directors or a person seeking shelter need to path or pass a breathalyzer test to walk in the front door. Right. So like that certainly serves as a screening process. Right, so it would seem to me that of all of the shelters in town, that line specifically probably has the least amount of concern. I'm not in your shoes, of course. I can't exactly see it from where you are, but I would suggest that under that section of code, you are clearly already pre-qualified. So my, my concern, kind of like Ms. Zolotel, you had mentioned that you know we submit the policy and then in the ordinance, I've seen references to the department and the director, and I'm not sure who that is or who those folks would be that would be making the determination on that. And my concern with that is kind of in the political zeitgeist that we're in now, where the you know winds are blowing in all sorts of directions. The I'm concerned that that role it would be like politicized, whereas like we for over 50 years 
have been in service to this population and this specific group um, without uh, much, much trouble. So my concern is that without knowing what the oversight process looks like is a little that's ner fair. nerve provoking. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fair. And I think that anybody who's been involved with this conversation now over the last six months going back and forth, hopefully we've demonstrated clearly our willingness to refine the tool as narrowly as possible. But I think in the one item you brought up, and I would ask if you have other specific areas of concern, you email them to us. The one item you brought up, I think you're the only shelter in town that is 100% pre-qualified for that item. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alatel. Thank you. Um, so this discussion has been really good. Um, we could maybe do a bit of a language tweak there as I'm thinking about it, that um, if there's admission of individuals who may be under the influence of substances or something, and if you have a straight sober policy and you have a way to enforce that policy, then that would maybe be simpler. So I appreciate that. I was going to mention kind of what Mr. Constant did. So thanks for this exchange because seeing how you view it is very different because we've been in the weeds on it. So the yeah. more that you have of that, please um, yeah, email or get in touch with us. Thank okay. you. Certainly, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Allard. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, actually, sorry, sir. It looks like there's one more. Oh, just one coming. In the way this is laid out right now, the director would be the director of the health department. Okay. It's just that section of code. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I think it's on now, sir. It's on. Oh, there we go. Good evening. I'm Dr. Michael Hannafin. I've testified before. I oppose the current licensing and zoning changes. As Ralph stated, he's run a very successful mission without any of the government's interference. This is simply another expansion of government. And there are a few instances where you can point to where the government performs better than a private business. It is readily apparent that this is a problem that you all created by spending COVID money illegally to purchase buildings for a problem that existed prior to COVID. You took the leap through the disgraced former mayor and the new acting mayor to purchase buildings without already looking into a study that would evaluate the zoning laws that are already in place and have been in place for very specific reasons. As a small business owner in a B3 zoned area, I am completely opposed to this regardless of the conditions. You're opening a door that's already shut. So you're gonna create more bureaucracy more government overreach on something that is being done better by the private sector. There wouldn't be a need for licensing and zoning changes had you not decided as an assembly and as the mayor to get into the business of homelessness. Through the chair, Mr. Weddleton, you, you mentioned during a community council member uh, meeting on the hillside that the Ninth Circuit determined that homelessness cannot be a crime. And while I agree with that, the APD needs to be able to do their job and arrest and prosecute the people that are violating the laws. If there's an encampment, there's rules against that. They get a three-day warning and then they come back and it just the cycle. So they move a block away and then turn around and come back because the three days starts all over again. I don't know what part of the assembly changed that, but that's ridiculous. I can't go camp out in the park strip without being arrested. But if I look homeless, they'll just give me three days to move my stuff and then turn around and come back whenever I feel like it. So I oppose this and I oppose the expansion of government over these processes that are being handled very, very well. You mentioned to yourself, what we currently have is working. As an example, you cannot use the Sullivan Arena as an example, that is a disaster. And I know that you've heard from several people during testimony before the assembly in regards to what the vagrants are doing, the flashing of the young 10 year old hockey players, the pissing, and all of the other nasty stuff that they were doing near those hockey rinks 
because they were allowed to loiter and do those things without repercussion. Or they moved and Sorry came back. Sorry for interrupting, but your time is up. Thank I do you. have a question though from Mr. Weddleton. Thanks. Uh, just a clarification, actually. We, more typically, it's a 10-day notice and before abating. And that is the result of a um, agreement. We were sued for um, being a little um, too aggressive with people who are homeless. And uh, so that's been the routine. A three-day notice would require that we store their stuff over time. So that can be done, but typically it's 10 days. And that's because we lost the lawsuit because we went in there being tough guys and fixing the problem. And there absolutely is, it seems totally unfair. If you go, you have a home, you're in trouble. You're going to get a fine. You're going to pay that fine because you're that kind of guy and you got the money to do it. But if you're homeless, we can't kick you out. If there's no bed for you to go to, that's the law. And it is very constraining. And a lot of what we do is dance around that. Regarding the um, licensing, uh, I am sure you have been down there to Third Avenue where Brother Francis and Beans Cafe are. And right now it's not I a problem. I volunteered there. Yeah, so you're very familiar with it. And you know that that area has been a horrible blight and talk to any of the neighbors who may some of them be here and you know that has been a horrible problem. So we can't say that it all works. I mean, rescue mission is remarkable. Most of them are, but we had a bad example. So this licensing is to prevent that, only that, and not to hurt, hurt these other business shelters. We want to encourage sorry, them and Mr. make Robinson, it easier. You have one example, but yet you have, I don't know how many homeless shelters there are currently working like the mission but you have many more examples of things that are working without your interference. That is a testament to itself. You cannot take the outlier and make that the example. That doesn't work. Well, actually it is mostly how most laws do work. We have laws against the guy who goes 80 miles an hour and most people don't and they're fine. But you know, the goal here is to be gentle with everyone, make it easy for them. They have their rules on drinking, they breath test them and they're done. But, but we did have a bad example and it was a tragedy, continues to be a tragedy for that neighborhood and we wanna prevent that. And do you feel that's reasonable or should we allow some deviations because most aren't? Handle the situations as they occur. No different than the cop would pull me over in an occurrence of speeding. However, to expand, you wouldn't need this licensing and zoning changes if you hadn't already purchased properties and spent money illegally at the time. Now, have the rules changed since Biden got into office? I'm sure they have. But at the time, I read the paperwork. And the paperwork for that COVID money was for a problem that did not pre-exist COVID. And you guys worked around it and you skirted around it. You gave the Black Caucus $437,000 to buy a building. Give the money to them. I'm, I'm, I'm certain that his shelter could use $437,000 to expand his operation and continue to help the homeless without your interference. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, my name is Louis Imbriani. I've testified many times in front of you before. Um, I've heard a lot of great things today talking about how we need more help for mental illness, more help for drug addiction. We need more housing. We need more affordable housing. However, these ordinances I'm strongly against for many different or many reasons similar to what uh, Dr. Hanovan had said, that this is the government getting involved in another aspect of something it doesn't need to be involved with. Anchorage has been around since 1964, and now until 2020, we just got into the business of housing the homeless. Uh, last year, it was a $800 or $8 million business that went to the pocket of SMG or ASM Global. Um, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I understand that we need more help, we need more services, but this is not the way of doing it. Give that money that we're gonna spend or that we're planning to spend on buildings and work with a partner to help them purchase it so that we as taxpayers are not on the hook for the maintenance, the upkeep, the staffing of that. We created this mental health first responder situation, which is great, don't get me wrong, but the fact that the municipality is running it is going to cost taxpayers more money. Yes, we have the alcohol tax, 
but the same thing goes. Why aren't we working with a private company that has those people on staff or has the ability to maintain the licensing and the staffing and the insurance to get those people working? Why is it all coming back on the municipality? I understand the 3P, the public-private partnership thing, but we keep putting the bill on the taxpayers. We have the money, we can use it to help. I know that people are upset about the ABC getting the money for their facility, but if they're going to do what they say they're going to do, awesome. But there's no accountability. We're just kind of doing it ourselves and you're the government. We do whatever we want. Sorry, folks. But we need to have some sort of accountability. How many places around town get tax breaks to help the homeless, to give services? Where do we see that go? I mean, I hate to point out churches, but churches are meant to help people. Yet they get the largest tax break on property taxes. I don't get a break on property taxes. So, I mean, if somebody is going to say they're going to help someone, hold them accountable to that. If they're not, then we use our resources, fining, code enforcement. But why are we putting the people of Anchorage on the hook for housing the homeless when we've never done it before? And this is just a gateway to allow the municipality to run that type of business. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Irene Quidno. Um, I also oppose the zoning changes and the licensing. On the licensing, um, it says the powers. Okay. Is that better? Okay, so I oppose the licensing and the rezoning and the licensing. I have one point I want to point out. It says the powers of the department, the powers of the department include but are not limited to under five. It says investigating shelters, applicants, administrators, caregivers licensees, employees of licensees, individuals associated with licensees, and other persons for compliance with this chapter, including such persons or entities the department reasonably believes are operating a shelter with or without a license. You're not the police. You should not have that power. If you have a concern about a shelter, then file a complaint with the police department. But for you guys to investigate these people, that's not right. And then I have three questions in regards to um, the buildings you have already purchased and that you want to purchase even before the zoning has changed. So originally you were going to um, get the Alaska Club. Then you said it was too expensive. Now all of a sudden it's not too expensive anymore and you want to purchase it again. So first of all, why is that? Secondly, I, as far as I know, I have not seen a budget that says how much the renovation for each of those buildings cost. That is a lot of money. I want to see numbers before you approve the purchase of those buildings because that's my taxpayers' money that's going to pay for those renovations. I also would like to see a budget for each of the buildings that shows the operational cost, including staffing, um, and the, the operation in terms of heating, everything included. What does it cost every single year? Because again, that's my money that's paying for that. And I haven't seen a budget for any of these buildings. So that's my request to get some numbers on the table before you purchase something. Because through the chair, Ms. Zalatel, you said last year when we were talking about $3 million for tax relief for the people that it's fiscally irresponsible to commit to a program when we don't know where the money is coming from. Well, I don't know where the operating budget and the renovation cost is coming from or how much it even is. So for you to commit to that by purchasing the building is fiscally irresponsible. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome.
Hello, my name is Rochelle Griffiths. I'm an Anchorage resident. I oppose the rezoning and licensing. It has been my experience that since the homeless were moved from Third Avenue at Brother Francis Shelter to a Midtown Shelter and downtown hotels, these areas now have a highly visible crime problem, which before they did not. Last week, I was driving down Northern Lights Boulevard and saw numerous homeless people sitting on the grass all the way down the boulevard. This I have never seen before. One resident shared that just last week, they witnessed homeless people having sex in public on Northern Lights Boulevard. The resident had their children with them. I call the cops on a man who was drinking alcohol in public right off of Northern Lights. The police were grateful for my call. They expressed to me that they too are tired of the rise in crime in Anchorage. There is nothing wrong with holding people accountable for their actions, especially if they are breaking the law. You may save their life. How else will they know that what they are doing is unacceptable? A few days ago, I was driving past Gamble and Fifth Avenue and saw about 20 people camped out in front of former Gamble Public Assistance Office at the east end of the building. I do not think moving the homeless people near residential areas will be safe for the people who reside in the area. There are not enough programs or a plan in place to support and help the homeless. The homeless need mental health care substance abuse treatment, and aftercare such as getting and keeping a job. Moving the homeless near residential areas and just housing them does not address the root issues. Approving these ordinances will increase crime in the areas that children play and where hardworking Anchorage residents have bought homes to live in. How does solely housing the homeless, allowing them to break the law, and putting them in residential areas help the homeless and the Anchorage residents. Ms. Allard. Is that a question you want the sponsors to answer? You may ponder it or if you'd like to answer now, but it's something to definitely think about. If you'd like to answer, I'd like an answer. Thank you. Um, so looks like Mr. Weddleton. So I just want to be clear here. So there are two different ordinances. There's the B3 zone change. Um, and then there's the shelter licensing ordinance. The B3 zone change, the sponsor for that is the planning department and the shelter licensing ordinance. The sponsor for that are Mr. Sponsors are Mr. Weddleton, Ms. Zalatel and Mr. Constant. But it looks like Mr. Weddleton did want to address one of your questions. Uh, um, yes, I think at least one. I mean, the proposal on the zoning is to allow it in um, commercial business districts, not within neighborhoods. Now, the current zoning, PLI, public lands and institutions, they're allowed in. That land could be anywhere. It could be in the middle of your neighborhood, like your fire stations, your schools, your parks are typically PLI. Um, so that current zoning would allow shelter in your neighborhood. Um, and, and that, that will actually remain under this proposal, but B3 general business is not within neighborhoods. Um, it can be next to a neighborhood and we see with the rescue mission is right next to a neighborhood and it's and it does fine, it's well run and um, that's what we expect. Um, and, and our goal here is to not allow poorly run shelters and to encourage the well run shelters. And, and I think one other point you made is you say when the homeless were moved from, Anchorage doesn't, as a city, doesn't run shelters. We don't do that. These amazing people, um, other shelters do run those. And what they did with COVID is they cut their occupancy dramatically. So as a result of COVID, we needed hundreds of beds more. And as an emergency, desperate thing, the city got into the shelter business. I'm not aware of anyone in the city or sitting up here who wants to be in the shelter business. We want to get out of it and let the people who do it well do that. Um, so anyway, we didn't move homeless out. We had a desperate situation that needed immediate attention and it ended up at the Sullivan and that's not a sustainable place for them. So thank you. Ms. Allard. 
I would also like to, to make a comment. There is absolutely no way anybody in this room could believe that the homeless uptick didn't happen because of this body, whether they were on the assembly or not. We are held, we should be held accountable for what has happened over the last five years. So I would say that it appears at this point that the assembly is in the business to run the homeless. And I say that because of all the money we have spent with the homeless and have accomplished absolutely nothing. The uptick and all the things that we are going to do as far as buying certain buildings, and I believe every person needs to be in some sort of rehab, whether it's mental or alcohol, drugs, we need to help. But when we're buying buildings, a day lodge, for example, you are gonna be looking at people who will not get help. And you as taxpayers, myself included, will be held accountable to pay that. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you, thank Chair. You. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Assembly members. My name is Donna Daniels and I live as the Raven flies, not too far from the old Alaska Club on Tudor Road, probably within less than a quarter of a mile from there to where my residence is at. The homeowners association that I currently live in, we have had for the last five years that I've lived there an ongoing issue with either people that have nothing better to do or homeless or a combination of both that are busy breaking into the vehicles on our property and trying to break in or have in fact successfully broken into one of the four buildings in our housing project. Fox Tree next door to us has a habitual ongoing problem. They are broken into probably three out of seven days a week. Is it the homeless? Is it the vagrants? Is it a combination? I don't know. I also work in downtown Anchorage in the Resolution Tower building. We have taken because of COVID, and I think once we're past this pandemic, of keeping the suite door to our office locked because I have had on a couple of occasions, drunks come in the front door of the building and sashay into our office and plop themselves down in the chair. I'm there in the reception area by myself. And when I come to work at eight o'clock in the morning, I am the only person on the fifth floor of that building until the next person comes to work at 8.30. We recently this year have had in excess of $2,800 worth of damage done to the inside of the Resolution Tower building due to a homeless, a vagrant, a drunk, whatever they were, getting in and ripping the security cameras down off the fifth floor, taking a fire extinguisher and beating the elevators on the inside getting into the stairwell, breaking doors from another business that went into the stairwell, as well as other damages. We have the Captain Cook State Park, Statue Park next to us, and it's quite a common sight to see people up there in all stages of inebriation, tossing bottles off of there down into the lower parking lot. We have them wandering out of the woods around there. I don't feel safe there, but I have to work. My questions to you are, after listening to everybody here tonight, the Sullivan Arena is going to shut down and put people on the street. Where do you guys expect them to go? They can't go back, from what I understand, to the Brother Francis shelter because they are maxed out still because of the pandemic happening. I'm not in favor of what I'm seeing going on at the old Alaska Club on Tudor Road. There are now barriers around the top of that building, which has led me to believe that somehow the current acting mayor has either purchased or is in the process of purchasing that building and rehabilitation is going on to that building, starting with the roof. It's on a busy road, Tudor Road. So how are you going to, if you're going to use that building against my better wishes, and I speak for myself, I don't speak for the rest of the neighbors over there in that area of town. And I'll, being working in the legal field, but not as an attorney, if you have somebody that's in an inebriated state wander from that facility out into the road and they get run over or severely mangled and killed, who's responsible? 
the city because they gave somebody that building or somebody purchased that building from the city or the poor or the person that ran over that person by accident. You're opening a whole can of worms here that I don't think you have a whole lot of questions for. And my last comment is sure. where Brother Francis is down at that end of Third Avenue, instead of fighting with Mr. Oliva, why are you not buying his property to expand the services from Brother Francis and Beans Cafe to across the street to that facility and also using the old bluff area where the old native hospital used to be? Thank you. So, Mr. Weddleton? Sure, thanks. Um, good questions. Uh, and I wonder if, uh, Mr. Chair, can you put that slide up that outlines what the current plan is for um, when the solar event closes? So it's kind of a broad outline. The status, and if, if I provide wrong information or you have more to add, I hope anyone will, um, on the old Alaska Club is the administration had gone and looked at it. It needed too much work. It was too expensive, so they walked away. Correct. The Alaska Club wanted to sell it, so they lowered the price, and they are doing some of the needed work to repair it. So I think there, it looks to me like I saw you know the things up there. It looks like they're repairing the roof is Correct. possibly one of the things. So Correct. there is uh, another offer on it by the city. It's in its due diligence stage that will end after the um, new mayor-elect takes office, so he can make the decision on what to do. So we're not locked into a purchase, but the price went down substantially. So you know, so that's still in play, but the decision will be made by the next mayor. Um, and then, I'm sorry, um, oh, um, buying Mr. Oliva's property and providing services. One of the proposals last summer was to buy the Beans building next to Brother Francis um, to create the services there that you speak of. And then I think many say, you know, the, a, a mat on the floor is not really enough. We got fundamental issues to deal with. So you bring services to where these people are and that's a more successful model. So um, that was a the plan then, but since then, um, Widener and Rasmussen, um, perhaps others I think, but I think it's mostly them, have decided they will purchase the Brother Francis, I mean, the Beans Cafe building for that purpose. And they're also negotiating with Mr. Oliva to buy his property um, for potential expansion, I think, and for more services. So essentially, instead of us doing it, um, private industry way, is doing it. Right, and that's preferable, you right. know. And, and they are doing it because they look at, and they've said this very clearly, is they look at our situation with homeless here, um, they've seen the process we've been working on, they accept it as reasonable, and they believe strongly that solving homelessness in Anchorage is possible, and they want to be part of that solution. Thanks. I guess I have one last question that just came to mind. There is a count of the homeless population that I believe happens on a yearly basis here in Anchorage. When that is going on, has anybody, and this is not meant to sound tacky, ever ask anybody that's homeless where you came from, do you want to stay here, or do you want to go back wherever home may be and look at offering the services to get them back home, wherever home is at? Go ahead, Ms. Alice um, so the point in time count, um, this last year wasn't the traditional point in time count due to COVID, um, but yes, those questions are asked and the coordinated entry. So when someone encounters or comes into shelter now, those questions are asked too, because the idea is to divert as many people from the outset as possible. Um, so those questions are asked and then it may not be immediate that we could, you know, help get someone a plane ticket if that is in fact their desire to do so. So there are sometimes barriers in the way, like we have to get the documentation to get a driver's license for the ID so that someone can get on an airplane. Um, but that happens. It happens more frequently than probably folks know. Um, I also want to, if you don't mind, um, I have the firm numbers for the Alaska Club I'd like to give. Um, so the owners agreed to take on repairs and reduce the price of the building by $1.4 million. So the total acquisition would be $5,436,000. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Yeah, before you go, there's one last thing that you mentioned that wasn't addressed, and I want to address it. Um, and that is the, the property on the bluff, the old Alaska Native Hospital site. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of very interesting kind of misinformation shared with the community that 
I or my neighbors are trying to drive away all of the homeless individuals in our town so that we can build wealthy condos for people. That's actually a message that's been shared really prolifically in this town. And my neighbors who live there, like I have a lot of neighbors and friends and constituents who live right there on the site of that property, all around it, will be the first to tell you, we don't want to kick everyone out. We actually welcome the operators in our neighborhood when they're operating in a way that is safe and, and not harmful to the neighborhood. But in this crazy arc from about 2002 to about 2017, the number of people receiving services on one 1,000 foot grid in this town went from about 50 to about all of those people minus 15% who are taking care of some pretty close by, some across town, a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. And the city had decided for a generation or two that the answer was send them all there. And that's the answer. And then what we as a community forgot was that we have a responsibility to ensure that they're taken care of when they're there and that we do no harm by driving them there. And so I fully and compassionately hear your fear when you think what we're gonna do is what this town did to my neighbors at Third Avenue because that's not right. But my neighbors at Third Avenue will tell you, we don't wanna kick them all out. In fact, we're happy to serve as many people as we can healthfully serve without compromising everything that we have. And so when I hear people say, send the people there where there aren't people, where it doesn't impact a neighborhood, I just wanna be the lone voice at least who speaks for the people who live there, whose lives are there and who have witnessed the worst of what the city and state can do. So I honor your, your fear and I have been driving the license in question because I will never allow what happened at Third Avenue from 2000 to 2017 to happen ever again if I have anything to say about it. Because frankly, it's the most immoral thing I've ever witnessed in my life. And we, keep, we can do better, we must do better, and we will do better by having smaller operations in areas that can manage a population, not everybody, because we don't, I don't wanna send you everybody because I've seen what that does. So I just wanna say I honor your fear. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Julie Colom. I'm with the Huffman O'Malley Community Council, but I'm speaking on my own behalf. Um, I actually, I thought it was a town hall, so I just had a couple of questions. Can I just ask the two questions, I guess? Uh, one of them is actually directed to John. Uh, Weddleton. Um, months ago, the community council had put comments in that we were against the zone change. And part of that was we didn't understand why they couldn't, as if someone wanted a homeless shelter, why couldn't they just rezone the area that they wanted it in? And John, at the time, you had said, well, you can do that, but it's costly and it takes time to rezone because of the process. So when I got handed the licensing pamphlet, that seems a lot more burdensome to someone who wants to operate a homeless shelter to give them that requirement and, and, and not have them just rezone the area that they want to put their homeless shelter. I think the, the blanket B3 rezone is scaring people precisely probably because of just what uh, Mr. Constance said, you know, we're, we don't want that happening in other business districts or neighborhoods, but, you know, that out of control feeling. And I can see where you guys are feeling like, well, if we get it licensed, we get out of control, that, that won't happen. But I guess my question is, why, why can't someone just go through the zoning process if they want a homeless shelter uh, somewhere that's not PLI? Why can't they just go through the process, the community process, the planning and zoning, and just get that area rezoned? Yeah, that's for you, John. Did, well, did you have anybody, you, I guess. You have two, I'm happy to answer it. Did, did okay. you have a second question you want to ask now too? Oh, or? yeah, my second question, is, my second question was, um, if the licensing goes through like this, what kind of rules or control does the city have over um, shelters that are based in faith, because what I saw with the Hope Center the other week was kind of scary. So, are you? Is this an open door to let them, or for the city to tell them 
who what they can do if they can minister within their religion is there any restrictions or threat to them being able to accept who they can accept and how they rehab people or uh, minister to the people thanks um, Mr. Whittleton tends to answer our rezone question, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to him. No, I just, it's nice to see you in person. I think we've only met through email and uh, right. Zoom meetings, so it's great to see a real right. person. So hi, and, and I, I really appreciate your work at the community council level. Um, you know, uh, someone can rezone, obviously. Um, I don't get an advisement there. Uh, you know, it is more expensive, more time consuming. It is a barrier towards you know, for getting more shelters. For somebody who wants to open a shelter, it's a significant barrier. The conditional use process also has a public process, um, but it is um, much easier to do. Were they to rezone a piece of property to PLI, if the mm -hmm. B3 thing isn't passed, um, they would still need a conditional use permit. So it still requires a conditional use. It's generally done as part of the rezone. So it's just a rezone is much, much more difficult to do. Um, to PLI has special rules, so it can be anywhere. Like I was saying, it could be in your neighborhood, it could be anywhere. Um, and you don't have the small lot limitation. You know, for any other um, rezone, you can't spot rezone, they call it. You have to be at least one and three quarters acres. And, you know, for B3, you'd want to be adjacent to it and so on. So, anyway, there's, um, but, but, but it's just harder. And we want to make it easier for the good operators to do their job. Wherever they did, they rezone or find a nice place in B3 that works that still need a license if the license passes. So it's not like PLI doesn't require a license. Um, is it um, more expensive and difficult to do the license? The, the licensing, um, hopefully not. And, and most of what it is, is really just saying, you tell us what your operating thing is. They have operating procedures. I think we heard quite a lot. We know that they do. Tell us what they are. Okay, check. Um, are you accredited? We're good with that. Um, it really is very light. Um, yeah, but it's a John, lot of words, you know, but it's not very paperwork with the city paperwork with the city. That's a well, whole another headache. So I'm just yeah. concerned that that is going to be you're concerned about the rezone rezone being burdensome. But I'm concerned that the licensing is very burdensome. And what I hear from the gospel uh, rescue mission is that is exactly the case. They are um, a lot of homeless shelters are not equipped to have someone in an office dealing with the licensing requirements and all the other things, and that's all they do. It's, it's very skinny staff. So that I just I was surprised at how thick the licensing requirement is. It's just it seems a bit too much. It, it is thick. It, it should absolutely not require anyone to spend full time on it. Um, I absolutely hope that it will restrict and stop and end a shelter that operates in a way that causes blight around a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I hope that shelter never can open because of the licensing requirements. Yeah, and I, I think in, in the emails to back and forth, I, I understand the motivation and I've, I've listened to Mr. Constant a lot. I understand the, the motivation of trying to make sure that doesn't happen, but to someone else's point, most of the shelters are not doing that. You had a really bad problem in one, and I'm not really sure why that one happened. I don't know all the, the reasons why it happened that way, but I hate to penalize everybody that's doing a good job now with this burdensome regulation and paperwork. Sure, just, yeah. just briefly on that. It's, <laughs> you know, the, Brother Francis had a conditional use permit. The conditions were fairly light, but we found we had no tools to stop. And, and they're doing a great job now. It was a period of time, certain things, and, and it was a lot of comment with Beans Cafe, their feed and everyone, there's a combination of things. So I don't want to pick on any person or group, but we had no tools to change what was happening there. Mm -hmm. That was the issue. We had no tools. There was no speed limit, mm -hmm. right? We, you know, no speed limit, no ticket. So we had nothing. So this shelter license is our attempt to find a way to give us a tool where we can stop problem shelters. I guess I just ha I hope you guys maybe try to limit what is required for the licensing and still have the tool. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Thank you. And Ms. Colomba, thank you for your concerns. And I would say at every turn, every time a shelter operator has come to us and said, we're afraid this is burdensome, we have turned around and figured out what's the issue, 
that we need and what's the issue that you have and we're finding a way through it. And so we're fully committed to continue that work to get it right. And that's why we have also extended the effective date to 2023, which would give us time to work out in detail the nature of these issues, especially as relates to current operators. And Mr. Weddleton kind of riffed on what I wanna make sure people understand is that if a conditional use is granted in PLI, it provides you no protection, zero. If an operator has made the decision or circumstances have made the conditions such that nothing can change, nothing will change because mm -hmm. the conditional use doesn't work. I've walked through the process from the beginning to the end where you had a concerned neighbor who became more and more concerned and a little more unhinged at every turn because everything he'd invested in was destroyed. And he finally got a hearing with the Planning and Zoning Commission. And mm -hmm. the only thing that came out of that meeting was, well, you should come up with a memorandum of understanding between you and the community council. Maybe that'll help, right? And in fact, it, it did help, but it was a very small thing. And this was back, if you remember the summer of Spice, when every ambulance in this town was in front of the shelter and they were doing laps between the hospital and the shelter and people were on the street wearing hospital gowns and getting their second trip for the day. I mean, it, just a total disaster, like nothing you could ever write. Your fiction teacher would tell you you were full of it. Mm -hmm. And so the licensing sparks from that place where when you have no other option, we need a tool. But the one thing that we've committed, and I will continue with this commitment until everybody's confident with it and we've run through the process, the difference between the current operations at the Hope Center who is operating under an emergency grant under Title 16 is that they don't have any real protection under that section of the code. It's a designation of a political appointee of a mayor who makes that possible. But if we grant them this license, then they have the extensive due process protection that comes with a license. That means they have an administrative appeal, means they can come back to the assembly. It means they can go to the superior court and have a ground to stand on, which we, we believe you know, in the old days when you had a job and things weren't going so well, your HRs that we need a performance improvement plan, mm -hmm. that this process ultimately is a performance improvement plan for an operation that's falling off the mark. Mm -hmm. It's not intended to be a heavy paperwork regulatory process. And I am with you. I have tried to apply for a grant with the municipality and it's more onerous than writing a federal proposal. Mm -hmm. And so we're aiming to do just the opposite here. Mm -hmm. And with every turn, give us specifics and we will look exactly at that section of the code and we will find a way to make it better. Right. Uh, what's well, so someone gonna answer the other one about the religious? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> if you want, Meg. Uh, what Hope Center is the best example of conversation last week and last year and two years ago. Uh, in this case, this doesn't apply to them in any way. And the sad thing about that, and that's because of their zoning and where they are at this time, they don't get that enhanced protection. They don't have an option for it. And so, but no, there is no uh, law that's going to be crafted into this code that puts restrictions on people's practice of the free exercise of their religion. Okay, so uh, I guess I lo you lost me on the Hope Center. What protections are they supposed to be having that they don't have? This ordinance would provide due process that allows you to go to the courts and it allows you to go through an administrative hearing and to the assembly for an appeal. But if you're designated under the Title 16 emergency shelter, you have what used to be zero notice. And then two years ago, we added a seven day notice for shutdown if there's cause. And now the that's where they are. And that's because their, their land use, their, their zoning is B2C, mm -hmm. not B3. And so it doesn't fit within the context of the extension of the, the opportunity here. Okay, so I guess maybe to clarify, uh, I mean, I was referring to the assembly telling them who they needed to admit into their shelter. Yeah, that's a different conversation. That's yeah. Title Five. I'm oh, sorry, that but was yeah. my miscommunication. Yeah, is that if you if you can <clears throat> pass something and tell a shelter who they can and can't admit, like what what stops you from telling the rescue mission they have to admit people that are drunk? They can't just they can't just let people in that are sober. They have to let everybody in. What's 
I would difference? offer that probably any given Tuesday is what stops that from happening, meaning an assembly could make that and then people could fight it in the courts. We wouldn't be successful, mm -hmm. right? That is their right to determine. But again, uh, yeah, I understand I think, your concern. I guess I look at the licensing, you got a little bit of an open door to throw some of those kind of things in a little bit easier than if you were just to try to confront it right now without the big packet of licensing. I just want to add on that um, I think that um, in terms of adding on things would probably more likely be um, done with um, the granting of municipal funds where we would possibly, you know, those contracts would be probably where you would see those things. This is really more the broad strokes. Hey, tell us what your operating plan is, who you intend to serve. Okay, that looks great. Your accreditation, great. Um, and then I just wanted to point out that 090 and 095 are those um, mechanisms that Mr. Constant was referring to. Oh, it's a okay. couple of pages, just so if you wanted to read them. Um, but I think there's a difference between when um, our funding gets involved versus not. Um, and I think that's a big difference or HUD funding or other um, public dollars. So this is not intended to be restrictive like that okay. um, and to let the operators operate as they operate and the um, clientele that they currently serve. Oh, so I want uh, so the Hope Center receives muni dollars. Not to my knowledge, no. Oh. And they're again, not, wouldn't be a subject to this. They're under that title 16 odd provision. Um, so would be the church cold weather shelters, the family shelter we turn on sometimes in the winter in the churches. Those would be the title 16 as well, where it's just turned on for temporary right. time. It's a little bit of a misnomer because mm -hmm. the Hope Center has been around for a while, but the um, health department director kind of flips that switch and then it's the seven days notice. Okay, so that's so that kind of goes back to what I was saying was, if you can tell someone who doesn't even take government money who they can let into their shelter, it kind of makes me nervous with this licensing requirement, what else is going to be thrown in that's all. I guess I, I would love to hear where you get the impression from the licensing, where we tell people who they can let into their shelter because we're saying tell us who you want to let right. into your shelter. And right. I think that's two different questions. Yeah, I guess it's it kind of goes back to maybe a lack of trust. Sure. Just makes me nervous. Sure. <laughs> that's May all. I respond? Sure, Miss Allard. And that's then all I, I got. <laughs> unless somebody else was before me, I apologize. No, I don't see anyone else. Okay. Hi, Julie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. So um, I think maybe one of your concerns is about how it might affect certain shelters. Mm -hmm. And I would reference uh, 16.125.015. Mm -hmm. And that's overnight shelter licenses. And if you look in section B, it says, um, I don't, I don't want to have to read the whole thing, but it does say that um, you cannot dismiss a person or not allow someone in without cause. Without okay. actually, it's quoted as saying, only for good cause. And apparently, I, I mean, this is stuff that I'm going to have to address and we're going to work together as a team and to figure that out. But those are things that I'm concerned about. And I, I would say that it would directly impact the, the gospel mission, the rescue mission. And so you have to think about um, that if there's another line, and I'll read it. To, it's number two under C. It says, a plan for screening persons admitted under the influence of alcohol or controlled substances and providing for their immediate needs. So if somebody walks up and says, or is drunk, that, that facility, that shelter would be responsible for addressing it. So I don't know if that means, do we call the police because they're drunk in public, because they actually need to be hospitalized? So those things are gonna probably be defined better. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I do kind of, I lean libertarian. So I get, a, I get nervous when I see the municipal government micromanaging these shelters to the point where it's really limiting how they provide the service. I'm not against homeless shelters. I'm not against getting out of, at all out of downtown. I'm not against helping people. It's nothing like that. It's 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 trying to give people who want to provide that service the freedom to provide the service in a safe way, in a in a way they deem safe, and and I understand why the municipality is trying to crack down on it. But I think it's unfair to the ones that have 
run, done such a great job. Chair Mayor, follow well. the rules. Sure, and then I need to move us on. Okay. Yeah. Um, part of the issue too is I, I was heard. I heard a broad sweep. I'm not about the broad sweep. I believe that those particular shelters should be held accountable, mm -hmm. but in doing the licensing and the broadening of the licensing, mm -hmm. and think, thinking that it's helping, to me it's targeting, mm -hmm. because there are shelters that are doing right, and I would I would. I would stand with the gospel rescue mission mm -hmm. and say that their plan and the way they run it should be a great example of how other shelters should be ran mm -hmm. and to do a broad sweep sweep could then negatively impact when it comes to licensing because you did hear that it could be shut down within seven days mm -hmm. and then what are you going to do with hundreds of homeless individuals right well yeah my husband and i did the emergency shelter over at change point uh for years and i can tell you we a lot of this was not happening and there's i don't know how that affects that emergency shelter situation where overflow goes to the churches um i don't know but i hate to see that go away thank you thank you welcome can you hear me okay yes we can okay i'll set my timer now my name is eugene carl haberman alaska resident for over 43 years approximately 20 of those years, resident of Anchorage and currently a Valley resident. I follow the public process and the public process done appropriately, decision made by the governing body is more likely in the public interest. Please know that I represent myself. I attend a lot of meetings, but first I'd like to say something that I've said to the Assembly for Anchorage Homeless Committee at least twice. I have to give you credit in regard to at least in your addressing homeless, you discuss this in assembly meetings in other locations. And that's a significant important part to when dealing with homeless versus out in the borough where more than 100,000 people live. I do not recall a single time at a borough assembly meeting even using the word homeless. For those in the borough who might hear me, homeless does exist in the Batsu borough, but it's not being addressed and I thank the Anchorage Assembly and the last two administrations, including the acting mayor and the former mayor for at least dealing with the homeless issue. But that's where I can say and give you credit. My concern and your involvement with homeless, I continue to be distressed in that, yes, you're very involved and that's very important, but you need a partnership involvement in whatever you propose on homeless you need to connect with the people. And most importantly, I need to say here tonight, where is a single voice being heard tonight from any member of the homeless community? You've heard tonight from other people and their concerns need to be addressed and need to be heard. But tonight you did not hear that voice from any single member who is homeless. And then when you're dealing with this issue at any time, you need to bring the community together. And that includes hearing from people who are homeless. Also, I'd like to address concern. Look on the screen up there to the public. This is not a normal assembly meeting. That's what you see, not like what you would see at an assembly meeting at the Lusak Library. When the public is speaking, the camera is on yourself, whoever is speaking, whether it's a chair of the assembly or, or a member of the public. So the public is not connected and the telephonic connections for people to call in is not seen here. And that's wrong. And I'll close with this and remind the assembly and administration. The first mayor of the municipality of Anchorage, George Selvin in Project 80s brought in Lusak Library. And the home of the assembly chambers is over in Lusak, not here or any other place. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Philip DeLand. I've been a Midtown resident my whole life. I graduated from UAA. Um, I love Anchorage. And I'm opposed to this plan of both the regulation and the B3 rezoning because basically this isn't going to reduce homelessness. This is going to subsidize homelessness. And you're going to put homeless pockets all over town where they have no accountability whatsoever they can show up at any state of inebriation, do whatever they want, basically. Um, and one thing that I haven't heard anyone address tonight is that if you build it, they will come. 
Like this isn't addressing just our homeless population. This is creating a framework to import more people who will come here and word gets around. Hey, Anchorage is a great place to live. We used to have a permanent fund. That's a separate issue. But uh, I talked to a homeless man in the lower 48 that said, yeah, I'm going to hitchhike to Alaska. I heard they pay you money to live there. And I was like, uh, yeah, hang on, you know. But anyways, this is creating a network that is just going to expand homelessness over time. We're going to be importing people and putting all of the burden on the taxpayers. And you're actually importing votes for people who will become voters and then vote for the things that you guys want to pass. And you're paying them off with beds and meals. So this is a serious issue that nobody's talking about that this is actually going to expand hopelessness, homelessness, expand hopelessness, that was a correct. Uh, and it's actually going to increase the problem and it's actually creating a voter block that will now vote the way that the assembly wants them to vote. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Good evening, um, Sherry Laurie. Executive Director of the Downtown Hope Center. Um, I just want to address a couple things that I just, this is the first time I've actually seen this version of it. I've been on vacation and didn't see it. Um, and you're right, Chris, what you said about it. It doesn't affect us, except for if the director decides that it does. <laughs> so in um, 16125010D, excluded facilities go down to three an emergency shelter operating under authority of chapter 16120 does not require a homeless or transient shelter license under this chapter. The director may determine an emergency shelter's actual operations subjected to the license requirements of this chapter. And if so determined, shall give notice that that emergency shelter of the requirement to obtain a license under this chapter. So there is that possibility. And I had not seen that in there before. So that's one thing. Um, and I, I just wanted to give some numbers, I just calculate them real quick, of the difference between the cost of a government-run shelter and a private-run shelter. Hope Center Shelter costs approximately $18,000 a month for 40 women. Sullivan's is about a million dollars a month for 400 individuals. That comes out to 600 a night at Hope Center for the whole shelter. At Sullivan, that's $33,000, $33,333 a night for the shelter. We're about $15 a person per night. At a mass shelter, it's $83 per night per person. Our, that comes out to, at Hope Center, $450 per person per month. At a mass shelter, about $2,500 a month. There's a big difference when you start having to calculate in all the things involved with a government-run shelter. Sullivan has been an incredibly expensive experiment. Um, it's it is possible to do this without a lot of money. I have a letter here from the from Heather Harris, who is the um, executive director, I guess, of the health department. And she even talks about the excessive expense of this and recommends looking into it more because there's so much expense involved with this, the number of personnel, the reports, the inspections, all those things. So I, I see what you're doing. I understand what you're doing. but. I would agree with many of the people here. The shelters are run well. It's just when you try to put them in a mass experiment like that, that problems happen. There, there are so many different kinds of individuals in a shelter. There are people with special needs. They should be in a place where um, it addresses their needs. But if we're gonna put so much money in shelters, what need, the place where the money needs to go is in mental health. I mean, you can put shelter, people in shelters all you want but the mental health issues get them kicked out because they become a danger to themselves and others and then they're wandering the streets again. So um, I think we, there's a lot of evaluating where do we wanna put the taxpayers dollars? I hear a lot about the mental health here, a lot of the, um, the drug and alcohol abuse, but the mental health- I Sorry think to is, interrupt, but your time is up. If you could okay. wrap it up really briefly. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And, Thank you. Uh, so in interesting you pointed that little section out, Sherry. In fact, 
I was trying to search in my memory banks where that came from. Mm -hmm. And what I believe the intent of that language was, was to give you the option. And so I think we'll rework that language slightly so that it's in agreement with the health department director, because we want you to be protected. So mm -hmm. the idea of finding a snafu box where you can't get out of because of spot zoning and specific rules, mm -hmm. I think that that's where that came from. I just don't remember seeing a draft of it. Um, to your point of the expense of the mass shelter, it mm -hmm. wasn't an experiment, it was an emergency response. And we did what we had to do. Believe me, I didn't wanna do it, mm -hmm. but we had to do it because we needed to put people somewhere because they had to live. And so that experiment as, as it were, was very expensive mm -hmm. and your numbers prove why we have to do what we're doing, which mm -hmm. is demobilize that place because it's too expensive. Yeah. And then the final point I would add is I am 100% in agreement with you. If I could be more than 100% in agreement, I would be that we need shelters to address specific needs of kind of larger groups, subgroups within mm -hmm. the whole population. Because if we don't, like the youth shelters, like the women's shelters, like the uh, shelter for people who experience severe mental illness, yeah. if we don't address that, then we continue to do what we've always done, which is drive them all to one place and pray that some miracle happens. It'll never work. And it doesn't work. So I am completely in agreement yeah. with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, actually, uh, Sherry, there was one more question. Ms. Zalatel? Hi, Sherry. Um, I was looking at that language and thinking about it and what Mr. Constance said. Would you feel comfortable with the idea, and you can take this back and as I like to say, noodle it and send me an email, mm -hmm. um, that the director at the request of an operator under Title 16 may request to be um, considered for licensure, so then those protections would apply. So it's something to consider. Um, I just want to throw it out there while I'm thinking of it. I'll also email it, but um, Thanks. Yeah, it's probably a wording thing. The, the one thing is just the increased expense, and it would be Rescue Mission and Hope Center because we're faith-based and we don't take you know, any public funds. So the expense of all these background checks, and like them, most about 50% of our staff are former felons. That So there's some expenses in there that I wouldn't apply for it because of the expense of operating under a license. So yeah, I, I understand that. You could also seek a waiver or if you were accredited. And again, that provision wouldn't apply the rescue mission because they don't operate under Title 16, yeah. but the Downtown Hope Center exactly. does. So let's keep the conversation okay. going. Thank That's you. That's good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have time for about three more individuals uh, who would like to speak who haven't spoken already. And then don't forget we have Thursday if folks would like to come back on Thursday. Welcome. Hi, my name is, Ter this is Teresa Langberg. I have a couple of questions. Uh, do it. I'm eating it already. Anyhow. Okay, so uh, application for new license. I've been in a volunteer in the homeless population for over 20 years. Uh, and let's see, it's 16.125. Uh, 040 number eight it says a, a sworn statement that a criminal background check would be performed for any officer director employee agent and volunteer so i've been a volunteer i have a background check i don't have any problem with that again there is an expense to uh the hope center and the different organizations but the what i really want to address is that i have taken my grandson to the hopeless uh, to the uh, downtown soup kitchen and to the hope center since he was three years old he has volunteered with me on the side i would not want him he could he even have a background check but i think what we're forgetting is that we don't bring and we put so many restrictions on volunteerism that we are going to lose compassion for the homeless now today my grandson's almost 16 and he will still look at people on the corner and recognize people that we served for over 15 years and he will have compassion for them and he will ask questions great questions of why are they there is there some place they can go if we do not bring a next our next generation into this situation it will always be a situation buying buildings is not the answer and you guys have bought these buildings but you have no plan to for the mental health which we have been addressed all night but you need to think about the next generation and bringing them into it and letting them see there is compassion and not bureaucracy and not business of the homelessness and if you start putting these restrictions and this is very broad 
uh, and that is my concern with this. It is so broad. You guys cannot tell me, I would not believe it if you did, that you wouldn't nitpick and make this to work for your benefit if you decided to change something. I just don't have enough trust in any of you that you would do that. So my concern is this is very broad and you are not really, I mean, licensing the ones that work. I mean, you're saying it really doesn't affect them, but it will affect them. So, uh, and then with the, with the B3 zoning, I live in a very nice neighborhood. Um, sure, I wouldn't want a homeless uh, camp or building next to me, but if it was well run by an organization that had proved themselves, then I would have no problem with that. Simply because as Mr. Constant said, um, we need to address this as a community, but you are isolating it as a business and you're making it very broad where you can stick your nose in the businesses that have worked very well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whittleson. Well, I just, um, one clarification, I think we did buy the Golden Lion. That was um, an alcohol treatment center, but we bought no other buildings. There is no building bought for the homeless and, and this all rests kind of independent of that issue. And I get you. I get that you've bought the Golden Lion, but where is for the general public? And I just hear that you've bought a building, and you don't have a plan. I don't see what you're going to bring mental health uh, issues in here. The homeless. There are so many who don't want to be in a building. They do not want mental health uh, help or rehabilitation help. But if you have a like the rescue mission, they have a process. People go in there and make a choice, and that's a great choice. But they're not seeing that. They're seeing this as another handout. You need to have accountability for the homeless. There are some that will never be able to, that we will never be able to reach. But there are some that say, "Hey, you can help me. You can't help me." I know for many years we had people saying, "I want to get help, but everything is full. Where can I go?" I don't hear you saying this is an established center that I can send you to, and they will work you through the process. And I don't hear that. I just hear, "Let's." have a building for them. Let's figure this out as we go. You don't have any grasp of what it takes. I'm really, uh, I hope you do at some point. Um, I think Austin, Texas has a great homeless um, I don't know, footprint. They've, uh, they've created huge communities of homelessness and they've integrated them into neighborhoods where they've learned to live where people don't despise them and people aren't afraid of them they have compassion for them they are in integrated into the neighborhood so i don't see any of that here i just hear you forcing us to uh, have licenses for these homeless facilities and that you're changing the voting and that the voting system with this uh the zone excuse me the zoning and that our votes and our um, opinions are not ever going to be taken in consideration. It will just be the assembly. And I think that you're doing a huge disservice to our community, our homeless people, and really to yourself by having that power. Okay, sorry. Uh, just on that, because I, I, I'm, I'm very confused. Okay. But we can't speak long because we're running out of time. But the, the changes to allow shelters in commercial areas is intended to make it easier for the people who know how to do that and who want to do that, give them the ability to do that. It's not about us buying a building or the city running it. It's trying to make it easier for people who want to do it to do it. So I don't, so I'm a little confused on, do we, I mean, that's our plan. We just want to make it easier for the people who know how to do it. And regarding, and we don't, mental health is a separate issue from this, as you've stated, that's a separate issue. We're dealing right now just with this part. We're not ignoring the need for mental health and, and alcohol and drug recovery. We know that's urgent, but that's, we were dealing with that. We've done the parts and plenty to be done with that, but this is just a piece of the whole process. We can't just say, don't do this because we haven't done everything, right? So, and I understand what you're saying, but you're taking a process and changing it uh, where the public's uh, input for, and I know that this, uh, you've got me all frustrated, but, but you're taking the process that's in place that has been working, maybe cumbersomely, but you're taking a process and changing it. And I mean, my question is, why do we need to do that? Uh, because you're really creating um, a lack of public input and in response. So that it's not easier. Paper, more paperwork is not easier. 
I just thank you. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Thanks. I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, the idea of mental health services, I strongly support. I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. The idea of mental health services, I strongly support. Uh, permanent supportive housing costs about $52 a day in Alaska. Jailing someone costs about $142 a day. And a, a day in API costs over $1,000. And the functional problem we face is that we can't afford as a municipality to be the primary behavioral health, mental health provider. Thankfully, the state of Alaska has uh, through the IMD uh, Medicaid waiver, the 1115 waiver expanded the availability of payment for mental health services. So at the same time, all of this conversation is happening. The state is standing up the ability to bill for intensive Medicaid services that will provide those mental health care services. So this isn't happening in a vacuum, but the municipal taxpayer cannot afford to provide mental health services at the level that these individuals need. If, if we think housing homeless people is bad, oh boy, that's gonna be a whole order of magnitude above. Thankfully, the state has seen wisdom to expand Medicaid to do that. So does that mean these buildings that you're buying, that you're putting the mental health facility, I mean, you're gonna provide mental health services in the state and you can build a state to recover the cost? If you talk specifically about the Golden Lion, because that's the only okay, one let's that, do that the Muni has purchased, it's a substance use treatment facility proposed. And so those services are Medicaid billable and paid for by the state. And so whoever does ultimately operate that facility will operate it as a business and those services will be billed hourly and those hourly uh, wages will pay for the operation of the building because the state is making that investment and has expanded Medicaid. Same for mental health. Uh, it's just a different waiver and they're working through the bugs of that right now, but they have the substance use disorder waiver on and they're finalizing the mental health waiver now. And so the point of all this is that we have our part to do, which is the fact that we have people on the streets that are suffering and dying. And we have to do something because neighbors are feeling under siege. There's crime and trouble. And we have to, we have to act. Our act is to find emergency shelter, which is a short-term intervention on the way to supportive housing or someplace where they can live, hopefully healthfully and sober for most of them, and getting the services they need provided by the state for their mental health and their, their addiction issues. So it's all part of a very complex system, but we have our part to do, and our part is to make sure the people on the street aren't on the street anymore. Okay, so will a private enter, a private company run the Golden Lion for the city? Ideally, that's the case. We aren't in the business of providing health care. And, and I work for a substance use provider. And because of my conflict by being on this body and having mm -hmm. the appropriating ability, we didn't apply. We wouldn't apply because the conflict would be too high. But yes, there is an RFP and the opportunity for private operators who provide substance use disorder treatment services to do this work. So that was the plan was to buy the building and then to outsource it or to have a private company in? An expert, have an expert in providing substance use disorder services to provide those services for the best impact for the municipality, for our neighbors, for the people experiencing addiction. Oh, that was the plan. I, I, I didn't know. So I'm just like getting clarity of that. And the same would be the case for any shelter. We wouldn't be operating a shelter. We would be finding someone to do that work. So will the tutor location, should that building go through? Is that what you're your goal is to? I'm not holding my breath that that project is going to move forward, but if it does, yes, it would be a third party provider that has okay. expertise in provision of shelter services. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So I want to I want to just step back for a second and and just be very real with you. I've been a pastor for four plus decades, almost five, and I have always kind of prided myself in thinking that I really knew people, and other people would say, I think that I connected well with people and understood and had loads of compassion and all that. And then through a series of things, my engagement with the Hope Center where I am now, and my intimate connecting with our students and knowing their life has changed my life. And what I thought I knew, 
I discovered I really didn't. And I'm embarrassed about that. I really am. Because I was very sincere, very genuine. So I'm thinking about a bigger, from a different level here tonight. And I could go to, I could sit down and go through the document point by point with all of you. But I don't want to do that. What I do want to do is make a plea for us to not build something that we're going to have to fix down the road uh, because we built it too quick and we're, we're too much of a rush and for whatever reasons. And we've all been around to watch things that were built too quick, you know, that we had to go back and fix later on. And we all know that fixing it later on is more costly than originally. So in saying that, though, I am very grateful, sincerely grateful that we're here, that you opened this up to have this conversation and that you invited the public to be able to participate just like you do at Lusac Library, you know, on Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, and you're, you're around there a lot. So I'm very grateful and I want you to know that I genuinely respect you and thank you for your contribution and my my plea part of my plea is that what we do going forward is that we do this with each other and not to each other and i think it would go a long way in bringing healing in our city that needs to happen where we can find collaborative ways to work through it and i i picture in my head sitting down at a table and as friends acquaintances anyway, with good expectations toward one another and say, okay, here is our problem. Now, what do we need to do about this and all of us participating? And I know that that attempt is being made. I'm not saying that that's not happening. I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you wrap up briefly? Yes, thank you. What I'm saying is I don't think this process is done and I think that we need to kind of step back and let's sit down in collaborative fashion with the people who live in the trenches every single day dealing with this. Not somebody that's separated in an office building, but somebody who's there and lives it and understands it so much better. My life was changed. Stepping out of the church world into the ghetto world, if you will. And I, I am forever grateful for that process. And I'm inviting you to come get a picture with me and those of us that are in the places of giving our life for other people in, in this way. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Sappet. I have uh, spoken to you a few times. Could you speak a little closer to the mic, please? We're having difficulty hearing you. Okay, so I'm not gonna repeat what others have said, and I think others have made uh, very good points. Uh, so I'd like to offer up some observations. The uh, current homeless plan has been in effect since uh, Mayor Berkowitz took office. Plan's not working. And in fact, it's getting worse as evidenced by the increase in numbers. Continuing to do the same thing over and over again is the definition of insanity, especially since it's failing. For those of you who haven't heard, the pandemic is over. The shelters can go back to their previous numbers uh, I'm not quite sure why we need to build more and more and more. Perhaps we should improve on what we have. That money could uh, go a long way to doing that. Uh, I'm gonna paraphrase uh, Mr. Weddleton in saying that bringing services uh, to where services are needed is the more successful model. Well, in fact, that's true. We've seen that for decades. We've also seen that it's a waste of money to duplicate services within a certain radius. It's not cost effective. 
you are spending other people's money. Spend it wisely. So far, what I'm hearing is not spending it wisely. Uh, I'll also paraphrase Mr. Weddleton one more time. I think you made a, a telling point much earlier when you said, none of this is the, is the solution to anything. None of what you're doing is the solution to anything. Now, I may be taking that out of context, but I think that's the take home point here. These ordinances will not change anything. They will not improve the situation whatsoever. You need to change the paradigm. Continuing the same failed model, and I'm not including all of the private shelters, some of which are very successful. What I am saying is you need to change how you're getting involved. I think to some extent you need to be involved. You have to save lives where lives are in imminent danger. No question. That's what community services are about. But that's not what we're talking about right now. We have changed the model on how we do things for people many times. Orphans used to be put in orphanages. Then some smart person came up with the idea of putting them in foster homes. Doesn't always work, but it's better interrupt. than the orphanage but, um, model. Your time is up, but I do have a question for you from Mr. Weddleton. Sure. I, uh, well, I guess I'm becoming not the question guy, but the answer guy. Um, I mean, you make the point, you know, COVID over is over, so they can increase their capacity, maybe, but we can't tell them that. That's up to them. We can't say, hey, you got to take more homeless. And what, and I haven't done, the administration has talked to the shelters and asked them, will you go to the previous capacities? And the answer has been no, they will not. And I guess, I mean, it's people here who can verify that or not, but Brother Francis has made very clear they're not going to 240 or so. They're going to stay down at their, I think, 60 or less than 100. So, you know, it's up to them. We don't get to tell them how, what their capacity should be. And simple math tells us that 400 at the Sullivan are gonna need a place to go and we don't have even the old capacity. So that's, that's kind of where we are with this is, is really is a math issue. Um, is this a solution? No, but you know, if you walk a mile, it starts with the first step, every step matters, you know? So, you know, it's a complex issue as you know, and this is just part of it, thanks. I, I agree it's a complex issue, but what you're doing is not going to fix it. It's going to multiply the problems we already have. When Ron Oliva gets up and talks about the issues he's had, and that's what you're referring to, referred to earlier, people write it off. He can tell you conditional use doesn't work. Now, as part of putting together a facility, a shelter, why is the entity not buying the building? Why are you supplying a building? That makes no sense. Thank you. Ms. Allard? Thank you, Chair. So this isn't really a question, but what I want to say is that your testimony is telling. And I would encourage everybody in here to show up on 8th of June, because although this is a town hall, nothing you're saying is on record. And I think it's really important that you still go down to the assembly on, on the 8th of June and testify so that it's on record. So we know how to address these issues and we could go back and listen what the community has said and read it. Thank so you. none of this is on record. No, this is nothing more than Kabuki theater. So I think just to be clear, there's a difference between being officially on the record um, as public testimony, which this is not. This is not public testimony. This is a town hall and having this recorded. This is recorded and you can go and listen to it later tonight if you would like. Um, okay, so thank you. So we are now on closing comments. Um, we're a little bit late, but really appreciate everyone uh, for sticking with us and providing all of your com uh, feedback. So we're gonna go ahead and start uh, with Ms. Allard and, and go down the row. Thank you, Chair. So again, just if, come down, testify on 8th of June. Um, granted, it's being recorded, but we wanna have it on official record. So if you guys could come down, re-testify again. Everything you said was heartfelt and a lot of it was factual. 
If you have any questions, you can email or you can call me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, you know, the first time that I became aware that we had a, a problem with homelessness here in Anchorage was about a month after I moved here. That was a little over 40 years ago. I happened to be downtown on a Saturday morning about 5.30 in the morning. I was working at the Anchorage Times and they had newspapers that came out in the morning in those days. And I kept seeing groups of people standing on the street corners or in front of businesses loitering around and, and it, it was surprising. And, and so when I got to work, I asked one of my coworkers, what, what's up with that? Oh, he says, uh, the bars have to close between five and 6 a.m. in the morning and they're just waiting for the bars to reopen. Well, so that, that was our solution to the home, homelessness problem 40 years ago. But they changed the law to where the bars started closing earlier and Brother Francis was created to give them a place to stay. And now, unfortunately, we have additional higher number of homeless individuals and we hear complaints from people all the time about what's happening and with the homeless that they see they're they're not invisible they're they're visible they're on the street corners everywhere we've heard that tonight and so no is not a solution we, we're trying to figure out the best way through this maze and the the uh, the success that they've had over at the Tudor mission is amazing but we need another five or six of them if we're going to get uh, the numbers reduced. And so we, we have to start somewhere. And I, I, I think uh, these ordinances are creating a good discussion. And I, I think it's a good starting point to move forward from. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate everybody that came out. I absolutely appreciate the discussion. And I think every person that came up to the microphone, we could go on and on with, you know, and just having this bantering back and forth. And, you know, so uh, thank you so much for, for making your comments. Um, you know, I think for me, I'm not sure that this ordinance gets us where we're trying to go. I know there are people who absolutely believe that it's a potential tool. But um, I, like Mr. Peterson, there, the problem is not with the shelters that we have. It's not with the services that are being provided. It's the fact that there's not enough. And um, what I'm concerned about is the fact that I don't know of anybody that's knocking down the doors, coming to the municipality saying, hey, I want to open up a shelter and I'll take 60 people or I'll take 100 people they're not out there right now as far as I know. Prove me wrong. I would love to hear that there are people who honestly want to come and be licensed because they want to open a shelter in, Anchor in the municipality of Anchorage. Um, but, you know, having said that, I absolutely believe that we have to protect the services that are being provided for the small group of people that they are providing them for. But at the same time, we've got to figure out how to open the door and entice those that can provide those services. Um, so until we can have a conversation like that, I'm not sure this, you know, what we're talking about here in terms of the ordinance that are presented really get us where we need to go. And it's not so much that we need to do something different, um, but we definitely need to make sure that we're offering the services that are absolutely needed. You know, and I will say one of my biggest questions, and nobody's been able to answer this yet, I've talked to a couple of providers, my biggest question is, what do you do with those people who don't want services? They refuse. And I am so thankful for those that finally get to that place in their life where they say, I need help. And this is where I can go to get it. I mean, that's, that's fabulous. I think that I'm glad we have those. And, and I feel like, again, I think we need those. But the bigger question in all of this is there is an element of the population that doesn't want the help. And I don't know what the answer is for making sure those people are off the street, making sure those people aren't damaging somebody's home or business, damaging themselves, uh, hurting others. Um, you know, we, 
we saw a lot of violence in the Sullivan Arena. There were people that didn't want to be there and they were harming others while they were there. What do you do with those people? I don't think we've really gotten um, a good handle on that. And yeah, I know somebody's going to complain because I said those people, but those are very specific questions that I have about how we can really address some of the, the, the tougher questions. And I don't see us getting there. And that's what I would like to see more of. So if there's anybody out there that has people uh, that know they, they, they can answer that kind of question, I hope you'll encourage them to come on Thursday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thanks to all of you for coming here and for participating. I really do welcome the opportunity to listen. I appreciate um, the attention that the sponsors have been giving these ordinances and, um, and the desire to work through the issues that have been raised. And I look forward to further discussion and amendments and maybe S versions as well. I just wanted to touch on a couple things because every time we talk about homelessness and I, I think it's very important that we do as a community, these are hard conversations um, and it's, it's hard to summarize, it's hard to make sense of everything. We, we care deeply about our community and we all know people who struggle and who have been touched. I, I think it's, it's important to keep in mind that um, Taxpayers are already paying the cost in many ways. Mr. Constant mentioned some numbers. Also in, you know, just first responder costs, you know, we already are paying those costs. Um, Mr. Peterson mentioned Brother Francis Shelter and why that came about. And it was originally a public-private partnership and the municipality had a very big role in it. And eventually, through the years pulled out and now I believe really only provides the land um, for a minimal lease and occasionally emergency shelter money. But um, that was in response to a need. And I think one of the things that um, I know I like about the licensing part is that it will make clear the commitment that the municipality will have with any operator, which is an important piece so I think there's a lot of value in, in, in these ordinances and they're two different ones. Um, and as far as you know, the comment about the buildings, you know, why would the municipality you know, buy these buildings? I, I don't wanna see the municipality get in the business of providing services and that as I believe it was Mr. Constant spoke to that has not been the intent, but many of the nonprofits and some of the faith communities have come to us and said, we can't do this on our own, we need help. And one of the ways we need help is um, with capital acquisitions, with access to buildings. And so we're looking for the ways in which local government can be a good partner. And um, again, I appreciate all of you coming here and the feedback and I look forward to more conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I really want to thank everyone for um, coming tonight and, and sticking with us till the end. Um, and I want to encourage everyone to come again on Thursday and bring some friends um, and we'll have some more discussion um, that will hopefully continue to lead to a better ordinance. Um, so um, even though these uh, are not official um, public hearings, these, these are still very useful. They allow us to hear great feedback and continue to refine this, these products that we're working on. Um, and I also wanna encourage outside of Thursday for folks to come to our June 8th public hearing. And um, I'm sure we'll have a lot of folks there and we'll, we'll hear from as, as many folks as we can that day and any following day. Um, I want to really thank the Denina staff for helping make this happen and clerk's office and assembly aides for all of your help. And just lastly, I want to thank uh, members of the public for coming again. Thanks. Well, thanks. This um, is a lot more fulfilling than a typical public hearing. We got three minutes and we move on. I think the dialogue has been really good and look forward to more on Thursday. And I'm I'm really pleased that the operators are continuing to be open as we are for the last seven or eight months to sit down and figure out how to do this. And, you know, on the licensing, you know, I, I, as I look at it, you know, if someone's 
driving 50 miles an hour through your neighborhood and there's no speed limit law. Well, I guess that's just it. You just have to learn to live with it. But we have speed limits. We say it's 20, 25 miles an hour. Because there's a law, you can stop it. And right now we have no law for shelters and most are doing fine. They're driving respectfully through the neighborhood, but you get that one operator for some period of time, maybe the teenagers and they're speeding through the neighborhood where we can stop it because there's a law. Right now we don't have that and we need something. And you know, I fully understand with a document you're holding in your hands now, it doesn't work for the license, but we need something to prevent those few wayward speeders. Um, and that's what we're working on. And we want to work with the operators because the ones that go on the speed limit, we don't want to bug you. We just want to have a tool, which we don't have now. And we heard conditional use doesn't work. Ron Oliva tells us that. Chris will tell has been telling us that for years as well. We need something more than the conditional use, which has its role, but it's not enough to really put the hammer down when things have gone awry. So we're looking for a thing to, you know, a way to do that. And again, the city does not want to be running shelters. We want to make it easier for people to run shelters. So we want the licensing to be easier and we have to provide a place right now. If someone said, you know, you guys need more shelters and I've got an organization, I want to help do that. You got to go to PLI, go find some. And if you can't, then we say, okay, well just find a piece of property, write a contingent purchase order on it and then go see if you can rezone it. And eight or nine months later, after six to $10,000 or more, um, you might have a rezone get through. Well, that's that's a deal killer right there. You know, it's more typical to have allow these things in general commercial districts, and that's what we're proposing here. It's it's actually more normal. You know, what we have now does not work. We are not in a place that works right now at all. We are in a place that doesn't work, and we're trying to improve that. And this process hopefully will get us to some pieces of ordinances that will do that. Thanks. So I agree with a lot with what Mr. Weddleton said, and that was really going to be a lot of my comments. I also, it really resonated that local government can be a good partner. Um, just to take you back briefly to the summer of 2019, when the state pulled out some of its um, homelessness money, we scrambled. We were in a really tough spot because Brother Francis was going to have to reduce its census by over 100 people. And how do you pick which 100 people just don't get to stay in shelter because you're out of money? So we've made investments in overnight shelter. We've made consistent investments in ensuring that overnight shelter can be stable because we always scrambled for cold weather shelter every winter, knowing winter was going to come. So I'm not saying we're not going to, and then COVID hit. And so some of that work has been interrupted. That said, as we work to get back on track, these are good starts. They don't stop asking the tough questions and working on the tough problems like Ms. Kennedy raised. I think those are tough problems and tough questions, but it shouldn't stop this forward progress from laying this initial groundwork. Um, and I don't think we should just look at these ordinances in a vacuum. We've made other um, investments and are working to try to close the gap where state services are no longer assisting um, the municipality, whether that's mental health services or substance misuse services, but we can't do it on our own. So we're doing what we can, when we can, with what we have, um, and we're trying to make it so the providers and the experts can come in and find this a favorable environment to do business and protect the communities. Thanks. So first, I'll start by apologizing. I can't be here on Thursday. I'm going to be in home at a wedding. And, uh, you know, this has been a very provocative and interesting conversation. And this has been a very provocative and interesting ordinance process. I think that if you are in the community of providers, it would be hard to not affirm that we've been very closely working and working hard to make sure that this process was not like others that have been experienced in the past where the train left the station before you even were told it was coming that this project is one that has been developed in close partnership with those most closely affected something i just realized is this conversation at the end came across the dais that we have heard a number of concerns about experiences in the past of shelters that haven't done the best i would say half was circumstance and half was just an inability to see what i can do differently because i have these sick people on my doorstep and i must do something to help them 
And so it, it's not to levy blame, even in those worst times on any of the operators circumstances, the Muni turned its back, the people turned their back, we all turned our back and that is unacceptable. But it's interesting to point out that the two shelters people loud in this conversation, and we have heard the most about are two shelters that are currently operating in business districts near residential neighborhoods. I hope that's not lost on people that both the Downtown Hope Center and the Gospel Rescue Mission are in zones right next to residential neighborhoods in commercial districts. So the proof that these can happen is in fact in the room right now. The proof is right here, right now. It was suggested that this isn't, you know, on the record. This is on the record, but the purpose of this meeting is fact finding and to hone in more closely on what we are trying to do with input from the public. And I think we've been successful at that today. I heard from Ms. Kennedy that what she sees in these ordinances is that it's just not enough. It won't do the job. It doesn't actually answer the question of how do we open more shelters for the people in need. But the fundamental need for an operator is twofold. They need a place to do their work and they need the money to do it. And what we're doing here is we're providing the opportunity for many more places in this community where this work can in fact be done with the least burdensome step that we can come to. And again, we're still willing to fillet as many layers off of this licensing requirement as we can to get it to the least restrictive means of achieving the goal of having a last stop on the train that we can say this can't happen anymore because as it stands right now under the conditional use paradigm, there is no method if an operator is failing for us to step in and enforce them doing their minimum requirement. And so we need these tools. We need places for people to go and we need to help them find the money to do their work. And then finally, the toughest question I think Ms. Kennedy asked is what to do with the people who don't want help. And I think that the fundamental answer to that problem comes in a capacity framework. We have to look at it as capacity. The Ninth Circuit has clearly told us you can't move people if you don't have a place to move them. And it's a cognate to that, that you cannot enforce certain rules if you don't have an alternative. Like we cannot cite people for going to the bathroom outside if we don't have a place for them to go to the bathroom. And so there is a place for more robust enforcement. But my friends at the police department will tell you they enforce the law at every opportunity that they can. That's their mission and they love their mission. And so I would offer that the answer to the problem of what to do with those who don't want help is we help all that we can who need help. And then we use the police power to enforce on those who refuse. But we only do that when we have enough resources that it's not the only tool we have. That's the humane response. That's how we keep our humanity as we try to move forward through this. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, that concludes our uh, town hall for the evening and look forward to seeing folks on Thursday and on June 8th.